Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Commission's panel discussion on the interaction between our mental health system and our justice and forensic systems. I'm Penny Armitage, the Chair of the Royal Commission into Victoria's Mental Health System. I'm joined by my fellow Commissioners, Professor Alan Fells, Dr Alex Cochran and Professor Bernadette McSherry. On behalf of the Commission, I acknowledge Abor Aboriginal peoples as the traditional owners across all the land on which we locate for today's panel's discussion. And I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. The Commission had sought the participation of Dr Emma Kasser of the Department of Justice and Community Safety in today's panel. Due to ongoing work across the department as part of the response to COVID-19, Dr Kasser was unable to attend. The Department of Justice and Community Safety has instead provided a statement addressing a number of the key issues which will be explored today. This statement will be accessible to the Commission's, through the Commission's website, together with the transcript and video from today's panel discussion. We would like to discuss with you and seek your views about the critical topic of people living with a mental illness and their involvement in the forensic mental health system and the criminal justice system more broadly. When we speak of the criminal justice system, this includes the courts and correction system and the involvement of people living with mental illness with police. The Commission has received a wide variety of submissions which identify this as a critical topic. In its submission to the Commission, Victoria Legal Aid summarised the tenor of many of these submissions when it states that there is an overrepresentation in the criminal justice system of people, including young people with mental health issues. The justice system must not be the default mental health service provider. The submission goes on to say that people experiencing mental health issues are at a greater risk of contact with the justice system and are overrepresented in the prison and youth justice populations. This is not a new problem. The Burdigan Report of 1993 is a seminal Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission national report into the human rights of people living with mental illness. 27 years ago, the report concluded that many people were taken into custody or had their detention prolonged as a consequence of their mental illness or disorder going untreated and that untreated mental illness clearly causes some people to behave irresponsibly, irrationally or in a bizarre fashion. Sometimes this behaviour brings people to the attention of the police. In a small number of instances, untreated mentally ill people commit violent acts actions against others. In 2006, a Senate Select Committee inquiry regarding a national approach to mental health reached the same conclusion. The circumstances noted in these reports in 1993 and 2006 not only persist in Victoria today, they appear to have worsened. In its interim report, the Commission referenced the latest survey of prisoner health of those in Australian prisons, which indicated that 61% of people entering Victorian prisons had a diagnosed mental illness, and 35% of Victorian prisoners were referred to a prison mental health service. Further, concerns around community safety have resulted in significant legislative reforms to the bail and parole systems. This has led to a large increase in the number of people in prison and on remand, which appears to have been exacerbated, uh, which appears to have exacerbated the situation for those living with mental illness. We will be asking you questions today about how these issues might be addressed in an enduring way. I want to emphasise that our examination of these issues is not about laying blame or finding fault. Rather, our inquiries are very much forward focused. We want to understand the very various impacts which the justice corrections and forensic mental health systems have on people living with a mental illness. Importantly, we want to explore how these systems might be improved for the benefit of those engaged with them and the community more broadly. A redesigned mental health system must enable consumers to, ex to access the treatment and support they need when they need it. In doing so, our services must respond not only to the needs of individual consumers, but to our shared aspiration for a safe and connected community. We must be able to do better for people like Leona, who in her evidence to the Commission stated, when I think about my offence, I feel like I had hit rock bottom, like the light inside me went out. It felt like I had charcoal in my chest and I lived that, like that for years and years. 
Today's panel discussion is just one way that the Commission is conducting its inquiries on this matter. In addition to considering the inputs received so far, the Commission is engaging further with consumers and carers as well as the mental health workforce to hear about their experiences and ideas for improvement. Finally, on behalf of the Commission and my fellow Commissioners, I want to extend my gratitude to Mr Dan Nicholson, Ms Julie Edwards and Dr Shamia al -Khadi. I know each of you have put a considerable amount of effort into preparing for today's discussions. We look forward to hearing your views, insights and ideas for change. I will now ask Council Assisting Georgina Coughlin to provide some opening remarks before we formally begin the panel. Georgina. Thank you, Chair. I too extend thanks to Mr Nicholson, Ms Edwards and Dr Alcardi. They've all contributed so much time and energy to this process for which we're very grateful. I should note that each panel member has provided a written statement, which will be published on the website. Those statements cover a range of issues, not all of which will be touched on today. All panel members responded to a number of questions for the purposes of the panel discussion, and some of those will be explored further today. The purpose of this panel discussion, as the Chair said, is to share ideas on topics, um, identify points of agreement and disagreement, if they exist, at this point, it's helpful to outline in broad terms some of the, um, the areas that will be addressed in today's discussion. Firstly, the overrepresentation of people with mental illness in the criminal justice system, the community discourse around mental illness and offending, problem solving courts and processes such as the assessment and referral court, neighbourhood justice centre, Koori court and drug court, treatment and support in a custodial setting, and also treatment and support in transitioning in and out of custody. The panel will discuss these topics in relation to adults and young people. Whilst the panel members may have different views as to the appropriate age bracket for young people in the context of the criminal justice system, and it is an evolving space, for the purpose of this discussion, the panel members agreed to approach it on the basis of an 18 to 25 age range. Can I now just briefly introduce our panel members Mr. Dan Nicholson is the Executive Director of Criminal Law at Victoria Legal Aid and the Executive Director for the Western Suburbs at VLA. He's responsible for the delivery of legally aided criminal law services across the state. He has also held the role of Commissioner at the Victoria Law Reform Commission since 2018. While VLA works directly with clients are who, in, who are in the mental health system, much of their work with clients experiencing mental health issues is in their day-to-day -day work in mainstream systems for summary crime, indictable crime, child protection, family law, um, family violence, discrimination, social security, migration, tenancy, NDIS and prisoner legal health. Ms Julie Edwards is the Chief Executive Officer of Jesuit Social Services. Ms Edwards has over 40 years of experience engaging with marginalised people and families experiencing breakdown and trauma. Jesuit Social Service is a social change organisation. It provides programs and advocacy around six main areas, um, two of which I'll highlight, particularly for the purposes of the panel discussion today. Um, justice and crime prevention for people involved in the criminal justice system and also mental health and wellbeing support for people with multiple and complex needs and those affected by trauma, suicide and complex bereavement. Dr Shema al Khadi is the newly appointed Executive Director of Strategy, Planning and Performance at Forensic Care. Prior to that, she was the Executive Director of Community Operations. In that former role, Dr al Khadi's responsibilities included oversight of Forensic Care's Community Forensic Mental Health Service, partnering with Forensic Care's clinical leaders to enhance organisation-wide clinical governance ensuring delivery of service models and organisation-wide leadership of various stakeholder portfolios. Dr Elkhardi's previous appointments include Clinical Governance and Performance Lead at Beyond Blue and General Manager, Rehabilitation and Reintegration, Corrections Victoria. On that note, um, perhaps if we can now commence with the panel discussion. Um, and I propose to uh, approach this by identifying the topic and then proceeding uh, with a question and directing that to one of the panel members. So the first topic today that we'd like to canvas is 
the overrepresentation of people living with mental illness in the criminal justice system. And so many of you have said in your statements and, and the Commission has heard time and time again that it's, it's well accepted that there is this overrepresentation. Perhaps if I could direct this first to you, Mr Nicholson, and pose this question, what can be done to prevent people with mental illness becoming involved with the criminal justice system? Thanks, Ms Scotland. Um, so I think we would identify three broad areas for change and I'll sort of touch on each of those without running through everything in, in too much detail. Um, first is we've identified in, in our submissions and recommendations and um, comes through in the interim report that, that there's this big gap in the mental health system between the sort of 10 sessions by Medicare um, and crisis and acute services where people often end up losing their liberty and autonomy and coming into contact with the criminal justice system. So, um, you know, the first issue is really about that, that missing middle of uh, mental health services that doesn't have anything to do with the criminal justice system that enables people to manage their mental health in, their, in the way that works for them and enable their treatment to flex up and flex down um, in the community. And the second big area, which I'll spend a bit more time on, is uh, really for people experiencing mental health issues, um, the net of the criminal justice system is just cast too wide. Um, uh, so, you know, um, we see a number of factors in play in this net being cast too wide. First is that the system has defaulted to police as the first responders, uh, mental health uh, issues. And while individual police do their best, the reality is that that just increases the likelihood of criminal justice involvement. And so we'd like to see um, as much as possible specialist health providers responding or where police do need to respond, that it's done on a, um, a joint response uh, like the existing PACER or um, Mental Health Police Response Initiative. Uh, and also where police do and police inevitably will respond to um, people experiencing mental health issues on their own, that they're better trained to do that. Um, then when we see police involvement um, with people experiencing mental health issues, we think we just have the wrong toolbox, I suppose would be the best way to describe it. Um, and uh, some of the key reforms that we'd see to, Im to improve that, um, that net widening um, is offences, summary offences reform. So um, particularly offences that disproportionately affect people with mental health issues like um, addiction uh, and addiction, you know, begging, offensive language, small scale drug possession. Um, we think uh, there's, they should be removed from the current um, statute book as summary offences. Um, we'd like to see better access to caution and diversion, and, and that's something we may touch on um, later in the discussion, and better charging practices. And I think there are some particular issues with, with children, um, you know, particularly that uh, uh, the move from the child protection system into the um, contact with police, and, and we'd also like to see the, the age of criminal responsibility raised. Um, another significant net widening issue that we've seen in recent years is the impact of the bail uh, changes in Victoria, and we've seen firsthand the consequence of, the, of those changes, which are probably best summarised by one of my experienced frontline managers who said people are more likely now to be in custody because of the issues in their lives, not the offences they've committed. Um, so we see a lot of people spending short periods on remand when they're not facing prison, and particularly that's acute for people um, experiencing mental health issues who may have difficulty um, complying with bail conditions or are committing sort of repeated small scale offences. Um, and what that means is they end up with short periods on remand, which can be very disruptive to their, um, to the environment, to the supports they have in the community, but not long enough in, in custody to actually get any support or treatment while they're there or meaningful transition. Um, and again, um, we would recommend changes which don't fundamentally change the architecture of the Bail Act, but just uh, make a number of important tweaks that would reduce those unintended consequences. Um, and then lastly, I think when people do enter the criminal justice system, people find themselves unable to get out of it and it hinders their recovery rather than um, what we see is, which is the opportunity for the criminal justice system to be a moment of intervention, to help people to access supports and services, deal with the underlying causes of offending and support their recovery. 
Um, and again, there are a number of things we can touch on in the course of this discussion, uh, which we'd recommend as, as a change, uh, including you know, better access to problem solving courts, better support in the community um, if, through community corrections orders and bail. And for those who are in custody, better treatment and support in custody and then the ability to transition out. So I suppose I've, I've covered a lot of ground quickly, but they're the three big areas um, that we see uh, lead to overrepresentation and some of the areas where you could um, make significant change to improve that or re reduce that impact. Thank you, Mr. Nicholson, and we'll come back to some of those areas you touched on um, further on in the discussion. But can I direct that question to you, Ms. Edwards? Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, present and, and be with you today, all of you. It's a very important issue close to our heart, and I appreciate the opportunity. Um, the uh, architecture, I suppose, of the system from the most early intervention through to transitioning from custody that uh, Dan Nicholson has presented is one that I accept, and I probably would just be repeating a uh, number of things, which I won't do because um, I'm accepting that, but I will just add a few things. Um, I think the some high level over overarching matters that need to be considered are housing. That's a, a huge issue for um, people with mental illness and people who get trapped really in the criminal justice system, but it's also a range of housing options with support. Um, and that needs to be the mental health service side of things needs to be delivered in a more flexible way. One of the things that we note is increasingly, uh, you know, we would say that the medicalization of the mental health system means that even, uh, for example, psychologists who we would hope would be uh, more community connected often are not comfortable uh, engaging with people uh, in non-clinical settings. And uh, that for us is really important that people would be able to uh, be able to connect with people in their housing or special accommodation or uh, other facility where they are living. The other uh, point I'll bring up about that, which um, Dan has already referred to, but is the um, early intervention or early um, detection of, of people at early points of engagement. We know that people will end up at an emergency department many, many times um, having with, with some mental health crisis before they get proper treatment. Often they are um, discharged and uh, end up actually then, next time they're picked up, it'll be by the police or in, the, in that system. So we think there are opportunities along the way. And I would suggest emergency department is one such place where uh, better intervention could be uh, put in. I think the um, embedding, our own experience of embedding, for example, a nurse uh, with our reconnect team, so the team that works with people in the criminal justice system has been very positive. So a nurse or a mental health practitioner embedded with teams of case managers, et cetera, whether that be, um, department case managers who are doing uh, with people on community corrections orders, for example, or with organisations like ourselves, community service organisations who are doing that. I think that would be another pick up point, another point where we could strengthen and divert uh, people's engagement, including actually with police. Um, we've uh, seen some models overseas. Um, well, no, I, haven't, I haven't seen them up front. I've been reading about models overseas about police uh, having social workers. And we do have some examples of that embedded with teams. Uh, we're actually right now trying to do that in the area of adolescent family violence, um, because one in 10 call outs for uh, police around family violence are around adolescent family violence. And that is actually a big pickup point um, for young people and then gets criminalized and into the justice system. So we'd like to see some alternatives there. Um, I, I mean, it'll probably come up later, but there's a big elephant in the room in the way, which is men. Um, we know that 93% of the, approximately 92, 93, 94% of the prison population is male. Um, so if we want to intervene earlier, I think we have to do something about that. Um, now, whether that, how far we go back in terms of trying to change 
patriarchy and gender norms socially, I'm not sure what we need to do. But the reality is, this is something that I think we have a blindness about. That's largely who we're talking about uh, in this crossover around um, uh, criminal matters and uh, mental illness. And I think it's something that we need to uh, pay greater attention to. I think I'll leave it there. Thanks, Ms. Coughlin. Sorry, I was just unmuting myself. Um, thank you also um, for the opportunity to speak and to be here today. I think um, we're in agreement on some of on the key issues that we've just um, spoken about in terms of the overrepresentation of people with mental illness in the criminal justice system. What I do want to highlight is three aspects, and I think the fundamental principle um, is around flipping the investment. There's a lot of investment in the criminal justice system in terms of um, various types of rehabilitation and reintegration services, but actually one of the fundamental um, issues is around that early identification and assessment and early kind of holistic supports and being able to pick up those issues, um, risks of mental illness and serious mental illness early, whether that's through um, schools, sporting clubs, um, uh, hospitals, any, uh, obviously the policing response as well, but actually to pick those things up early um, and have the appropriate kind of response early on as part of that early intervention um, and really that being a key uh, part of uh, prevention, I guess, of the, that further kind of escalation into the criminal justice system. Um, we know that there is, as um, Dan mentioned, the, that missing middle. Um, we might have some sort of pockets of services at the beginning, but really um, they are also um, in some ways too late. We need to be thinking about, um, for young people, how we identify serious mental illness for some of those particularly vulnerable communities, Aboriginal communities, refugee communities. How do we pick up um, those signs of serious mental illness early um, and well before they're in the criminal justice system and providing an appropriate kind of comprehensive wraparound response. And I know we'll talk a little bit about um, some of those kind of areas of, of support, but really um, Julie's mentioned housing, but it goes beyond the housing. It goes to alcohol and drug services. It goes to living skills, family and community connectedness. All of those things need to be part of that early, a really comprehensive assessment opportunity and then a response to address the needs that are identified through that process. The other two aspects that I wanted to emphasise is the diversion. Um, there is, there's been lots of talk and reviews of diversion over the years and I think, um, again, if we look at it from a, a stage process and trying to minim minimise uh, people coming into the contact with the criminal justice system, um, diversion being a more kind of proactive strategy I think is critical. And diversion, again, supported by the relevant community connections and supports that are necessary to keep people out of the system and to keep people from offending and re-offending. Um, and then the, the other aspect I wanted to emphasise is the, um, the post-release, um, once people are in the criminal justice system, and I know we will talk about this later, but I think if we're, if we're wanting to really impact um, the lives of people with serious mental illness who come into contact with uh, the criminal justice system. We also need to accept that some will and always will come into contact with the justice system and it's how we support them when they leave and making sure that um, that support is in the best possible position to minimise that rec those rec recidivism rates um, for people with serious mental illness and to actually have an intensive um, response that works with people in the long term. We know that they're in the system because of long term issues, and so we need to work with them for the long term um, when they come out of the system. Thank you, Doctor. Ms. Edwards, could I just go back to you for a moment? Um, you've touched on the cohort of men. Dr. Alcardi's touched on refugee and Indigenous communities. Can I just ask you, are there special um, or different needs of certain communities in terms of um, how to prevent involvement with the criminal justice system and those people with mental illness? Um, yes, uh, we also work in the settlement and community building space and we are um, regularly advocating to the federal government for uh, better settlement programs. So I think that is an issue both 
in terms of um, English classes, uh, that the support goes longer than the first five years. So I think there's a range of things uh, that we need to do to help the settlement experience be a more positive one. Um, uh, and I think that would help prevent the uh, penetration of the, of the justice system. Um, with, um, we work with Aboriginal organisations, you know, like VACA and VALS and um, VATCHO, et cetera. Uh, and of course, the issue of overrepresentation of Indigenous people is, is a massive one. And um, what we've experienced being uh, the deliverers of the transitional support over many years is a sort of a changing feast of sometimes the ACOs are funded to provide that support and then, then that gets withdrawn, etc. We would we think that there should be a um, Indigenous specific response to Aboriginal people exiting custody and that those organisations should be supported to, to do that. What happens is sometimes it happens for a while, then perhaps targets aren't met or something and then it's withdrawn. And organisations like Jesuit Social Services have uh, good track records of working in partnership with ACOs for a period of time, perhaps providing some uh, of the, of the um, you know, the monitoring and support roles uh, to, to around the evaluations, et cetera. So, I mean, I think there are ways, I think we can be more creative about how we do that. In terms of um, particular groups, I suppose, I also wanted to um, mention young people, um, whether we say up to 25 as a particular group, that 18 to 25 year old age group, which I think we need a specialist response for, uh, whether it be in terms of co at the court, um, but also in custody and in the transitioning. Um, so I think that's a particular cohort as well. Thank you, Ms Edwards. Mr Nicholson, could I just ask you about that as well? Um, just whether there are particular groups um, that there are specific ways that they could be prevented from entering the criminal justice system, just bearing in mind that um, those individuals impacted by mental illness in particular. Sure, and ag again, I agree with a lot of what Ms. Edwards has said, and won't repeat that. Um, but I think, I mean, I think as a general proposition, the criminal justice system in particular hasn't been very good at listening to the users of the system or the consumers of the system, and so a big part of that redesign is actually putting, um, uh, you know, engaging in much more um, design by consumers. And that will help us to understand the different experiences that particular um, groups have. Um, in addition to um, Aboriginal people and, and young people, I would also just add um, people with dual diagnosis of disability and um, mental health conditions. And we see that's a significant area where people are falling through the cracks, um, perhaps not able to um, sufficiently uh, access either set of services or there aren't services out there that can um, that have the right skills or funding or workforce to, to manage both. And, you know, we've been particularly concerned about um, NDIS rollout, um, not fulfilling its promise of that more um, individualised um, set of services built around a person. In fact, people are falling through the cracks more and losing services they had access to through NDIS rollout. And what we're seeing as a practical consequence of that is people are ending up in custody because they are arrested. Um, there's not great support in, in custody for them and they, uh, may lose, once there's some justice system involvement, they'll often lose the NDIS supports or other supports they've got on the outside and will end up spending significant time in custody um, because of those gaps. So that's another um, uh, particular group uh, that I think we need to address. Thank you, Mr Nicholson. And Dr Alcardi, could I move to you just on this, um, the topic that we're covering at the moment? Would you like to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I think there is um, uh, the the broad principles of um, kind of rehabilitation in in the criminal justice system are, uh, are around the what works literature, and one of the key principles that are around that is that responsivity. So I think whether we're talking about um, broad kind of rehabilitation programs or we're talking about people with serious mental illness, the responsivity principle is critical in understanding the needs of particular cultural groups, the needs of uh, particular vulnerable groups in the community and how we respond to them. Um, you know, understanding the cultural kind of um, responses to serious mental illness in certain cultures in the community is critical to actually getting a, 
um, a, a better outcome for those rather than waiting until they're in the justice system and the, you know the, the service responses are limited. Um, and you know it's a really interesting question around um, you know co-design in the criminal justice system because um, it's certainly you know, one where if you ask a lot of women and in the past, having done lots of workshops with women in, in, in prison, men in prison, Aboriginal men and women in the community around their experience of the criminal justice system, there is an enormous amount of um, uh, experience and, in, and, I guess, intelligence, if you like, that we can learn from, where in some ways they can tell us um, exactly all the things they thought they needed and perhaps sometimes what they didn't get. Um, that they thought would make a difference to their lives. And I think that's a, that's a very important um, consideration and something that I don't think is um, considered as often as it should be. Thank you, Doctor. Can I just stay with you for the moment and just ask you um, to elaborate on a point you made earlier about um, the importance of diversion and just to understand what greater role diversion can play and I'm asking this question broadly, not necessarily in relation to specific groups. Again, focusing on those interacting with the criminal justice system and with um, mental illness or mental health issues. Sure. So I guess um, in, in kind of considering the role of diversion in terms of keeping people out of the justice system, um, the the critical element of that is about being able to, one, identify um, a response or a behaviour for someone, you know, and this is generally often, at the moment, most often the case in terms of a policing response, people come into contact with the police because of their, because of their behaviour, some of which has been, has been described can be bizarre, irresponsible, erratic. Um, and uh, actually being able to provide a response that takes them away from um, uh, the criminal justice system by referring them to various agencies that can provide them with support, understanding what supports they may already have that they need to kind of strengthen, um, and actually providing a, a, a more integrated response rather than um, really just either the cautioning or even at the moment where uh, some of the responses are to send them to an emergency department. Now, well, that may be... Um, uh, an option, but actually we know how pressured our emergency departments are as, and they're not a mental health response. And um, they, they, they struggle, and in our experience, kind of looking at people discharged even from prison, they do struggle with the, um, the, the process of um, assessment and really kind of having the resources to assess someone's um, mental health needs. And actually to be able to link them in with the appropriate services, whether that's housing or any other kind of emergency kind of crisis services. So the principle being that the diversion on its own has to encompass a whole range of um, supports and, and uh, facilitation of connections and community linkages um, that allow that diversion to really have a meaningful impact. Otherwise, we're just talking about repeated kind of episodes of diversion, if you like. Thank you, Dr. Ms Edwards, could I direct that question to you? What, what increased role can diversion play? I think there's a point also, you know, how we describe diversion, like whether we're talking about police or at the point of court, et cetera. Um, but I think, again, um, and the, can, we can't have social workers or, or whatever maybe embedded with police teams everywhere, but there are particular times when we, we're aware when police are called out to situations where by having... Um, uh, someone with, say, social work expertise or clinical expertise in the team, and again, I'm, I'm going back to our experience of adolescent family violence, uh, is, a, is a, a really good intervention to actually unpack the situation, um, <clears throat> excuse me, perhaps make arrangements for the young person to be somewhere else uh, for 24, 48 hours while things are sorted through about um, what's the next step about keeping everyone safe. Um, at the moment, there is, in that area, for example, there's nothing else to do other than take the person into custody, uh, to charge the person, take them into custody. So that's one area where we're seeing a lot of growth and we think it would be important and it's early on in the person's cycle in terms of violence, as in we're talking about people under 18. So um, that's just a practical example. Um, I think... Uh, again, diversion from further penetration of the justice system, we would like to see um, a base, I suppose, a ba as a basis that 
short-term sentences don't exist. For example, in Norway, where we spent some time on a study tour, um, offences that were under a certain period of time, 12 months, 18 months, two years, actually never, those people never got to serve those sentences in custody. Um, by nature of the sentence, it was clear that it wasn't a violent offence, for example. So I think we could do some work to identify um, how we can keep people who have committed uh, non-violent offences out of further penetration in the system, which then leads to how do we get a range of community arrangements in place um, that can support, because I, I agree with uh, what Chamber was saying, it's no point just diverting, but diverting into nothing. I think it's an identification point um, to get other services in place um, rather than just um, delaying. Sometimes diversion can be delaying uh, what's ultimately going to happen. There needs to be um, some intervention at that point. If I go back to the very early part of the system, though, I think it's important that the other, the, the, cha the challenge there is not to just do a net widening um, thing. So, for example, with young people, um, the diversion program that's in, in place now through the, uh, the courts is actually very good in, in terms of um, setting up a program that the young people uh, comply with, in which case it doesn't even have to come back to court. So I think we just have to be aware at the very front end, our diversion program shouldn't actually become inadvertently a net widening, widening program because we're guaranteeing that the young person will get some service at least, and therefore magistrates and others are keen to bring them in so that at least they get something. So I think we have to watch that when we talk about diversion. It's good, but we don't want to bring more people into the system. And sometimes inadvertently, that's what diversion programs can do. So they need to be geared to, and they should actually be provided by community-based organisations uh, rather than police and rather than by government departments, we believe, in that early stage. And then I think you can look along the continuum about what diversion means at different points. And the other point that I just reinforced then is at court, uh, and we would like to see a presumption that short-term offences, um, sentences don't get served in custody. There's enormous amount of uh, young, of not just young people, um, of people who serve sentences, sometimes 14 days. Um, many, many, many people, uh, um, I haven't got the st statistic with me now, but under 12 months. And again, I'll just share a brief anecdote. When I was in Norway and I was talking to the governor of one of the prisons there, he couldn't believe it. And he said, so you've got a whole lot of people who are just churning in and out under 12 months. And I said, yes, he goes, that would be a nightmare to manage as a, as a prison governor. And he talked about everyone who comes into his prison, he's got there for two years. The others, you just deal with some other way in the community, a range of community arrangements. It can be still uh, perhaps um, turning up every day, uh, electronic monitoring, um, perhaps even having to go in weekends and stay somewhere and do some therapeutic programs. But um, what he was saying is, everyone I've got is here for two years, the others have been dealt with elsewhere, and means we can do some serious programs. Thank you, Ms Edwards. Uh, Mr Nicholson, can I direct that question to you? Sure. So, I mean, I think there's lots of uh, elements to, you know, what we could broadly call diversion. So there's the pre-charge cautioning process and there's the post-charge diversion um, process. And then there's what other measures we can use at court to divert people out of the, out of the system. But I suppose generally, um, you know, we, where people have come into the contact with the criminal justice system um, because of uh, mental health issues they're experiencing, then for us it's clearly preferable and the evidence backs this up for them to be diverted out without a charge or without a formal finding of guilt by a court. Um, you know, unfortunately it appears that the numbers of diversions and cautions are actually reducing in Victoria, even though it's a great success story, um, and the number of at court um, charge processes is increasing, uh, even though um, uh, generally the crime rate isn't particularly rising. So that's an unfortunate trend that needs to be addressed, I think. Uh, and I agree that the diversion to services is crucial, but it's also pr very important, as Ms Edward said, that we don't impose so many conditions that police may be supervising, that in fact, um, rather than diverting people out of the system who should never have been there to, to treatment and recovery, 
that we don't actually inadvertently drag them in further. So um, the referral to services, properly funded services is really important, but that shouldn't be, it's not the same as a whole lot of onerous conditions on cautions and diversions. And I would say generally that we find that um, we spend a lot of time um, making the case with police for cautions and diversions to take place. And uh, often that's um, rejected in what we think are suitable cases. So we support um, removal of the police veto on diversion, which we have in Victoria, um, and also court's ability to caution in the same way that police can, which they have in New South Wales. Because for, for me, diversion is like any other um, activity at court, if you like. Uh, it's not a sentencing disposition, but it's sort of similar, which is that the view of police is relevant, but it shouldn't be determinative. So a magistrate should be able to order diversion, even if police um, disagree, and that's not the case, and that has a significant impact in our experience. Um, I, I can uh, um, just touch on the short sentences issue, if that's uh, helpful at this point, since Ms Edwards has, has raised it. Uh, and that is that we agree. I mean, I think generally, if you if you look at uh, overseas jurisdictions, comparable jurisdictions, short sentences are on the way out. Um, and there are various, you know, presumptions against short sentences and presumptions in favour of um, community supervision for short periods in, in other jurisdictions, which um, there's some more detail about in my um, statement and in, in some of the work the legal aid has provided. In Victoria, we're going the other way, particularly because of the unintended consequences of the bail laws, which is a very large number of people cycling through for short periods of remand and, short, and then um, as the SAC data Sentencing Advisory Council shows, often being sentenced to time served uh, in custody. Um, and as I said before, really those short sentences are long enough to disrupt your supports on the outside, but not long enough to get any help on the inside. And so, and makes it almost impossible to do proper transition planning when you have a large number of people coming through the system um, in short numbers. Now there's a range of views about short, you know, presumptions against short sentences and will only work, I think this is the crucial thing, if there is very significant investment in community supervision in community corrections, because otherwise there is the risk of just sentence escalation, if you like. You know, if you can't sentence someone to less than three months, well then you'll give them three months where they may have got a shorter period. Um, the crucial thing in making it work would be uh, proper um, investment in community supervision through community corrections orders or similar. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr Nicholson, can I just stay with you? I'm going to move on to the topic of community discourse. And the question I have is how can a better informed community discourse around mental illness and offending be achieved? Yes, so it, that's a, it's a, um, Big question. Uh, I mean, I think the, to start to acknowledge the issue, the first thing to say is that we do in Victoria have a particular um, concern about crime. If you look at the public issues um, data, people in Victoria are much more concerned about crime or law and order than other jurisdictions, even though statistically we are as safe or safer than most. So there is a disconnect, in, a particular disconnect in Victoria between concern about safety and the reality which needs to be addressed. So there is work to do. Um, I would say that generally the debate about criminal justice in Victoria is fairly impoverished. So as long as debate about criminal justice is dominated by three word slogans, it's very difficult to have a meaningful debate and we need to have discussions about criminal justice in particular about the intersection of criminal justice and mental um, health that extend to whole sentences and whole paragraphs, not just three word slogans. Um, and also this division into kind of good and evil, uh, the wrongdoer and the wronged, um, which is strange because I think everyone actually can relate to the idea that a person is more than the worst thing they've done. That's not a difficult concept. Everybody can, can relate to someone in their lives they know who's made mistakes and is not just the worst thing they've done. So in terms, I guess, of, of the way forward, first, if we've learned anything from the past few months, it is that if we lead with the evidence and do what's right, not what might just be popular in order to keep society safe, then the community actually responds well. And so I hope we can learn some of the lessons of the recent months in the way that we talk about criminal justice in the future. The second is I think that we have forgotten how to tell the stories of our success. So if anyone, has had the chance as I have to go to a drug court graduation um, 
for those who aren't familiar with it, if you get through the two years of your drug treatment order at the end of the two year period, you actually have a graduation ceremony in the magistrate's court with the magistrate, the police prosecutor, the defence lawyer and others will give speeches. You get a certificate, you get a photo with the magistrate. It's the most extraordinarily joyful experience you'll ever have in a magistrate's court. Um, and because what it does is it tells the complex story of the person who's come through very often trauma or homelessness or um, significant mental health issues and addiction and uh, turn their lives around with the right support and the right time and space. So I think we have to trust ourselves to tell those complex stories um, and that people can turn their lives around and, and successful stories because there are plenty of those out there. Um, otherwise, all people hear is the failures in the system when they read about significant and serious crimes. Thank you, Mr. Nicholson. Um, Dr. al could I direct that question to you? I mean, Dan's just articulated that exceptionally well. <laughs> um, you know, it, um, it's, a, it's a really unpopular conversation to have when you're talking about someone who's done something really terrible. And um, we know from incidents over the last few years that um, the, the conversation is overly simplistic and it is, um, and the debate is just isn't, isn't really there about um, how we can respond in more meaningful ways and, and, and um, the response of uh, uh, criminal justice response solely isn't enough and we already know it's not working. So I think um, one of the things that, that uh, you know, just to kind of reinforce uh, or re um, Dan's comment is as much as it is unpopular, I think um, if we can have that conversation, a more sophisticated conversation about the interface between serious mental illness and offending behaviour and have the community kind of be part of that and we're bringing them on the journey and that will always be supported by the evidence because we already know that the evidence is there. Um, I, I kind of think about this also in the context of um, other jurisdictions and the Yellow Ribbon Project that's in Singapore and whilst we may not have, you know, um, necessarily uh, agree with um, some of the prisons, prison operations in, in Singapore kind of environment. The, the Yellow Pri Pri um, Ribbon Project over there has been a remarkable success in the community owning recidivism outcomes and being part of that reintegration process for people coming out, uh, mm -hmm. coming out of prison and actually um, recognising that um, everyone has a role to play. It's not just police, it's not just the prisons, it's not just the community corrections officers, actually every part of our community has a role to play. And we have had some really, have some good success in some of these conversations in the community. Um, you know, Beyond Blue has opened the doors around, you know, what is mental illness and how to be aware of it and how to respond to mental illness in a way that is incredibly positive and, and has been incredibly engaging for the community over, you know, 20 odd years. It's really that conversation that now needs to move forward to the more difficult part and to sort of that more pointy end and more complex part because, um, you know, people can live with absolutely with, with mental illness and serious mental illness and sometimes they do do terrible things but that, that shouldn't define them forever. And so I think there's a, we've, we've got some success in those community conversations. We just need to be brave enough to extend them further um, and to be more sophisticated in our debate. Thank you, Doctor. Um, Ms. Edwards, can I direct that question to you, please? Yes, thank you. Um, Jesuit Social Services started a, a project, a campaign a couple of years ago called Worth a Second Chance, and that was specifically for uh, trying to build understanding in the community around young people caught up in the youth justice system. And we've learned a, a bit of, um, out of that experience. And of course, we did that because, as others, my colleagues have said, um, you know, Victoria is probably the safest place in the country to be, um, but that's not people's perception. So we were uh, also, a few years ago, felt that we didn't have the leadership either um, to um, uh, implement evidence-based programs um, compared with that being really uh, fed by what they, politicians or decision makers thought was community sentiment. So we were interested in actually engaging with the community. So this campaign, out of that campaign, what we did was um, engage with, did focus groups and engage with people. And what we 
learnt uh, was, first of all, of, as, as has been said, the perception is completely out of sync with the reality. In fact, we, we, when we presented at one place about the data, you know, some say, I think you've got that wrong, love. You know, that's actually not the case. And we're saying, no, this is actually, you know, um, government stats. This is, this is the facts. So there's a big gap between perception and reality. And what we found was that when we were able to have a, an informed conversation, uh, and a di I mean a conversation, not a sort of a berating or a just presentation of um, uh, data, but actually have a conversation, getting people to uh, contextualise the challenges that young people face, including thinking about the challenges in their own lives, because in fact, it's not a, se a separate breed of person. You know, we all actually have challenges at certain times in our lives and, and to actually soften people's hearts to remember those things when they're a teenager or, or whatever. What we found that when, um, when people had that experience, members of the public, uh, as long as they found, heard that the young person was being held accountable in some way, um, they were able to really shift their perceptions. So I suppose in broad, this is a restorative justice approach. So we would be keen to see that lens of a restorative justice approach applied more strongly across the criminal justice system, because ultimately what we're wanting to do is to restore a person to their family, to their community, actually back to themselves. And I know we're going to get onto problem solving courts later, but just Dan mentioned uh, one, and that's our experience very much, and particularly when we visited New Zealand last year to have a look at those courts. Um, it was very much about um, re-engaging a person back in that sense of belonging in, in the community, we think is really important. Um, I just want to mention one other thing, though, which came out particularly out of our visit to New Zealand, but also to other jurisdictions, was the leadership. And I think there's a sense that we need to get community sentiment on board, and I believe we do. But there are some places which have, in a sense, not waited for that. They have just shown the leadership. And um, I think New Zealand is one recent example of that, where um, Bill English, who was the Prime Minister, but when he was um, the Treasurer or the Minister for Finance, I think it was, he actually said that... Uh, the justice system there, the criminal justice was a, a moral and fiscal failure and that it had been for 30 years. Now that leadership then led to Jacinda Ardern and, and um, Minister Little, Justice Minister, being able to go through that door and get a bipartisan agreement about shifting the situation. And they began with a listening exercise around New Zealand, listening to, and we've heard about the voice of people affected by uh, that they had the same problem of overrepresentation of Indigenous people. But it was actually, the, it was the leadership, not necessarily waiting for the community. And I just want to say that I think it, we can have them in parallel. But if we wait for community sentiment, we might be waiting a long time. And in fact, when people are listened to and uh, get the information, they are capable of more than we think. So I just want to raise that point as well. I think it is a matter of leadership, not just waiting to convince the community that we're safer than they think they are. Thank you, <clears throat> Ms Edwards. Ms Nicholson, can I go back to you? Um, we're going to move to the topic of problem solving courts and processes. Uh, you touched on um, your experience or BLA's experience in relation to the drug court. Can I just ask more broadly um, what, what VLA's views are as to how well those types of courts and processes are working? Sure, so we um, provide specialist lawyers into all of the, um, or, sorry, not all, most of the problem solving courts, so ARC and drug, we have dedicated courts, we have dedicated lawyers in NJC, we have a dedicated lawyer and obviously have a lot of coverage into Koori Court too. Um, and so I'd say, I mean, they are working well, that's our practice experience, it's also what the research tends to show. Um, and I think, I guess, you'd, to put it simply, you'd say the courts, the problem-solving courts, create the time and space for the lawyers and the judges, um, but also not just the time and space, but the proper community supports, well-resourced, to actually enable people to deal with the um, issues that have brought them into contact with the justice system, not just the legal problem on the day, which is what we commonly see in the mainstream courts. Uh, and that's the, the crucial thing is that time and space to deal with the um, 
the, the broader issues that brought that person into contact with the justice system. I also um, just reflecting on um, Ms. Armitage, your opening about about the the um, client who talked about having hit rock, rock bottom and having charcoal in their chest. If you look at the case studies in our submission about people involved in problem solving courts, it is really about hope and a second chance. That's really what the emotion that comes through in their first person statements, which are in our submission. Um, so yes, I mean, I think that, um, th that, that proper access to services and time and space are the two crucial things. And the understanding that, you know, a magistrate who build a relationship with the person and understand that recovery may not be linear, but take a tailored approach actually to what the person's experience is to help them get through. Um, and I'd just say, um, you know, that it's a great shame that our world-class problem-solving courts aren't available everywhere. They're only available, you know, despite having been around for a number of years and uh, well evaluated, they're only available in a relatively small number of places geographically. Um, programs like KISP, the supported bail program, are um, oversubscribed in many places and also not available elsewhere. So in terms of um, solutions for us, it's pretty simple, which is to roll out the things that we know work well in terms of problem solving courts everywhere. Um, and of course, there is a longer term challenge around mainstreaming person centered or problem solving approaches in everywhere, everywhere in the magistrate's court that has to be worked on at the same time. But I wouldn't wait for that to roll out um, the specific programs, KISP, ARC, drug court, Koori court everywhere. Um, that's something that can be done immediately. And in fact, that will help in that longer term process of making the courts and the justice system more human centered because it means that in every location, you've got magistrates, judicial officers, lawyers, police prosecutors, court staff who are working in that problem solving or therapeutic way. So it helps in that mainstreaming process if you roll out the existing programs um, everywhere. Thank you, Mr. Nicholson. Um, Dr. Alcardi, just picking up on what Mr. Nicholson has said, um, what would you say is working well in those types of courts? I think in my um, kind of response, what I'll, what I'll kind of focus on is what the, those courts provide an opportunity to do without specific reference to particular courts. But essentially, um, the difference in those courts is that they look at the whole person. They consider the, tra the trajectory of what got them there, and as Dan said, actually giving the, the time and space to look at those things, that those those issues, and then respond accordingly. And there is something about taking the whole person into the conversation, um, and understanding all of their needs, drug and alcohol needs, housing needs, employment, education, all of those things, because we we know that the evidence tells us that if we intervene in any one of those areas, based on needs, that we will get a better outcome. I think, um, you know, the, the evidence is there, those courts have been, those problem solving courts have been evaluated, then being rolled out more broadly, you know, it's, it's an, it's an evidence based solution that is ready and waiting really for a broader, for an expansion. What I will say also though is Forensic Air has the um, Mental Health Advice and Response Service and that's a response service that's in the six, six um, of the magistrates courts where if people have um, people are referred to that service to determine or to identify whether they've got a history of a mental illness um, obviously forensic is able to do that because it has access to the various mental health databases and is able to provide back to the court or community corrections some advice about um, that person's mental illness and its interface with their offending behavior um, there is and, and that's, in a, that's in a mainstream court. It's not in a problem solving court um, specifically, but I think there's an opportunity to look at and, and understand how the courts are actually using that information and how it informs their decision making. There's not been a great deal of research around, um, that there's been quite a bit of research in, uh, around the specialist family violence courts as an example and, and the other courts that um, Dan mentioned, but a service like that in a mainstream court, I think there's more to be understood because it gives us an opportunity actually to look at how we can consider mental health in um, court interactions across the state. It's not a, again, it's not a particular problem solving court, but it's actually an opportunity to, to inject that conversation around someone's mental illness into the court process. It's not really yet understood how well, how magistrates use that information, what considerations how community corrections use that information in terms of recommending to um, the court any dispositions 
Um, and I think there's more work to be done to understand how we can um, not only invest in the, the problem solving courts that we know already, but actually um, what other kind of me um, mental health type responses should be embedded in all courts regardless. Can I move to you, Ms. Edwards, on this topic and um, discussing what's working well in those types of courts? Um, our experience is that uh, they do work well for those people that we're actually able to, um, uh, who actually can get access to them. Just talking to a colleague um, at Jesuit Social Services this morning about this very topic, it came up and uh, she was saying that, um, you know, as others have said, they're not widely accessible. That That's a key problem, but basically they're, they're very helpful. Um, you know, at my own experience of, of sitting in both overseas and, and here is, as others have said, um, it's a humanising situation. I think one of the major benefits about is it that the flexibility and actually seeing that person in front of you and being able to tailor things, taking into account their particular circumstances, their particular needs, their particular problems, um, and getting a bit more of a nuanced response. Um, just would also like to, um, having looked at a number of different ones, whether they be cultural ones, age appropriate, issue related like the um, alcohol and drug courts, but also place. Um, and my own experience uh, and colleagues with the Naval Justice Centre, for example, I think I'll, I'd really like to also see some more place-based ones like that because there what we, and the evaluation of, of that was very positive. But again, if we're going back to the understanding that a person is essentially relational and, and we're putting this restorative approach and about restoring them to themselves, to the community, to culture, etc., to family, then I think the idea of place is really important because um, say, for example, in Collingwood, I know that there in the city of Yarra, some of the, um, uh, the, the services were bought around that person. Um, the, some of the things that the community um, restorative actions they, they did were in their community. Uh, and so there was a, a healing, I think, that uh, went on at the same time. So I just think it's, it's it, all these things depend on what lens we're putting on it. Are we putting a place lens? Are we putting an age lens? Are we putting a, a problem lens, like you've got a mental health problem or you've got an alcohol and drug? Whatever we do, I think we just have to realise we're still segmenting and looking at one component of the person. And I think the main thing for us to bring to it is this understanding of the essential relational nature of the person and therefore a relationship-based response. So even if we're looking at the mental health issue or the alcohol and drug issue or whatever it is, the family violence, that we need to be um, bringing around that person the way of restoring them to a series of relationships that ultimately are gonna be there and holding the person when the justice system has intervention has walked away, etc. So I just think that we need to have that lens on it rather than it's a better way to get your drug treatment done. I think we just have to keep coming back to the restorative and relationship based essence of uh, these good interventions. Thank you, Ms. Edwards. Can I stay with you for the next question, um, which is what supports do people need, those, those people who have a mental illness? to successfully comply with uh, obligations from court orders? Mm. Um, again, it depends, but I, I'd say what we know that is we need a, a broader and a longer term support for people. Our experience is that, um, and again, it can be because it can be combined with an ABI, et cetera, and we know that 42% of the male prison population, for example, um, has an acquired brain injury. Our experience is that people often just aren't following or don't get what they're supposed to be doing. So I think it's really important that they're accompanied, especially through that uh, um, the time of, of perhaps um, an acute episode or uh, when they are in the process of trying to comply with a community corrections order, for example, that they are accompanied through that time uh, to help them understand uh, what they need to do. And, the other thing is, and it goes back to what Dan said, sometimes the range of um, uh, 
things that they have to comply with are very onerous and, and quite challenging and often competing with one another. So our experience around that would be uh, that there hasn't been a, a holistic look at the person and what they need to do. So they could be having, for example, um, being pulled one way in terms of complying with their order and turning up to see someone at the same time that they are endeavouring to uh, connect with um, part-time work or are endeavouring to connect with um, some training option or some treatment option. So we really see that often, for example, that they may be in a group or some kind of um, intervention, whether it be therapeutic or part of their order, but they're being pulled another way. And it's actually it's actually really demanding for them to, to manage that. So we think that we need someone to take that holistic and integrated approach to them and accompany them, at particularly um, at, at, at times, for example, when they are trying to uh, complete an order. At that time, particularly, it's very taxing, even physically getting from one side of town to another um, to complete um, a component of that order, like um, a trend attendance at a some treatment. So that, that would be probably the main thing I would talk about at that point. Thank you, Ms. Edwards. Mr. Nicholson, what would you comment on there? Um, I think that, for, you know, uh, overall across the um, community uh, court orders and community supervision, the, the two things that we see that people with experiencing our mental health issues particularly benefit from are specialist case, case management and direct uh, link up to um, specialist support services. Uh, and so um, that specialist case management is crucial, not just a sort of compliance approach to your community order, um, but also the reality of a lot of the community supervision orders is that um, it doesn't guarantee you access particularly to services. You can fold, if you like, your existing services that you may be able to access in there, but it doesn't um, generally uh, increase access to those services or give you specialist, uh, um, you know, better access to them. Uh, and so that means that where there is a shortage of services, you're no better off if you like, and, and your ability to um, uh, use that time when you're on a community order to um, help in your recovery is, uh, is limited. So there, I suppose that's the, the, um, the general, general position in terms of um, the bail support program, we, we would support a, um, a specialist uh, mental health program within that, um, which would be, um, be particularly helpful. And can I just ask you, just to elaborate on that, are there particular components of, a, of that kind of program that you, you would uh, recommend? Um, Yes, I just look. I think we see the current situation is that there's um, uh, can be delays in uh, referrals to supports and appointments with psychologists, and um, a specialist program that could increase availability of those supports would just ensure that people one can get out of custody and get the support they need on bail. But secondly, if they are on bail, um, give them a much better chance of complying with bail conditions and actually supporting their recovery, which would keep them out of out of the justice system in the medium term. So I suppose it's the, um, again, it's the, that access, the, those two, two elements of access to services and specialist case management, not just compliance, um, as part of that supervision, which is the, the two crucial elements. Thank you, Mr. Nicholson. Um, Dr. Alcardi? Um, I think I'd sort of like to emphasise um, a couple of issues. One is, um, you know, as Julie uh, mentioned, the need for a holistic kind of approach. So again, the evidence is there that if we intervene in housing, education, employment and training, um, living skills, family and community connectedness and mental health services as a kind of a whole kind of suite of um, service responses, then we'll get a, we'll get a better outcome. Um, those supports in the, in the literature are really practical supports that allow people to kind of, I guess, be empowered in their kind of recovery uh, journey, but also um, actually build skills over time that actually that prove to be useful, obviously, in then um, uh, leading more more productive lives or living with the mental illness in a more manageable way. Um, in doing that, I think what we need to be mindful of is how we bring case management and clinical understanding of clinical need together. So at the moment, they're kind of quite they operate quite separately. Um, 
whether that's in um, community mental health settings or in the in the justice space, there's kind of supervision on the one hand, and then there's clinical assessment on the other, and clinical and, and, and clinical interventions. And I think in order for us to kind of be able to provide that holistic approach, there is actually a need to consider how the how those things can be brought together, and how we have really multidisciplinary teams that um, where your case manager has a very good albeit not you know a fully qualified clinician sound clinical understanding of the needs and equally your um, your clinician who's involved has a very sound understanding of supervision obligations and that kind of uh, those other elements that you know um, will be in incredibly important to keeping people out of, out of prison so I think um, uh, you know, there's been there are lots of challenges in that. There's a workforce development issue that we need to think about in terms of how we deliver and develop a workforce that can complement the service delivery that we need and the service model that we need. So, if we're thinking about how and how we can actually bring in those community-based services um, in a way that is kind of seamless and um, is and, and is sort of dynamic, so people will need housing services first and foremost before they can consider, can consider any other um, issues around education or employment or um, being involved in any kind of clinical support because if they don't have anywhere to live then all of those things become really quite um, unimportant to them at the time and, and, and to actually have a service response that can shift and change and fluctuate with the needs of the person. You know I guess we can kind of what we've done so far is to have a scattergun approach because all of these services are siloed and they're operating there, you know, across a government kind of government public service sector and not for profit and so on, and sometimes private, that we just have a scattergun approach where we refer to everywhere and let's hope for the first thing that hits and start with that. And actually what we need is a more comprehensive kind of assessment based approach that can identify what the needs are, a plan for what those needs are and for the service system to work together. An example for that is the ramp in the family violence space where we've got you now those risk assessment management panels working with different organisations around the table. They are working with the most high risk um, families and individuals, but actually there's a recognition that there's, there's more than a policing response and more than a mental health response that's required to get those individuals uh, or to mitigate the risk for those individuals. So can I just pick up on, you mentioned workforce development. Um, can you just elaborate really on the key components of that in what you were describing? Um, yeah, so I think, um, you know, and I, I guess in this I'll reflect on my time. Um, uh, in corrections, we have case management kind of um, uh, roles that are in the system and they are often quite separate from um, the clinical interventions that are being provided. So I think the workforce that we need to support the outcomes that we need has to be a workforce that can think in those multiple dimensions, the supervision, the compliance, the clinical need, and actually the psychosocial needs. So actually we need to have um, a, and, and develop and build a kind of professional workforce in this space that has consideration of all of those things and then is supported by the, sp the specific professionals that we need. It's not to say that a case manager should be acting as a clinician, but actually they should be understanding clinical need and working closely with a clinician. And I think the workforce that we have at the moment for, for reasons of resources and other, and other structural kind of uh, reasons, um, really only into work on a need to know basis. And of course, you don't know what you need to know until it sometimes is too late. So actually to have a more integrated response. And I think the example that I think about is when we have clinical reviews for, for clients um, with mental illness or serious mental illness in our services. Purpose of the clinical review is to consider all aspects of their needs. Um, and I just wonder, and I often think about whether a process like that um, within the justice system would actually yield us the outcomes that we're looking for. Um, thank you, Doctor. We're going to take a break shortly, but is there anyone else who'd like to comment, um, Ms Edwards or Mr Nicholson, on that topic? Are you talking specifically about workforce? Je no, just more broadly on the supports that are needed. I think with, from, I mean, with my colleagues, I think that's been covered. I think the... Um, it's the it's the breadth. It's taking the holistic thing. It's making sure it's not just about compliance, but about attending to need. Unless we address the underlying need, not just manage the the risks or make sure people complete their orders, um, then we're just going to have a repeat. Yeah, 
So yes, I think we've covered that. Yeah, and I, I strongly endorse um, what Dr. Elkadi said as well. It's a very sophisticated answer. Thank you. Perhaps now if we have a 10 minute break. Um, so we'd be returning at 10.30. Okay. okay, I'll see everyone then. Okay, Georgina, I think we're all back. So Thank let's you, get Jeff. started. Thank you. Thanks. So the next topic we're moving on to is treatment and support in custody. And the questions I'm asking relate to both adult custody and youth justice. And if I could direct this first of all to you, Dr. Alcardi, and I'm going to ask you about um, optimal treatment and support. If I could ask you to address that question firstly in a broad way, and then secondly in relation, particularly in relation to youth. So if you could, if you could please address it in those ways. Um, it's quite a long question, so bear with me, and I'm happy to come back to, and repeat it later too, if that if that's needed. Um, the question is this: What does optimal treatment and support for people with mental illness in custody look like? And we're interested in knowing how it could be improved, and if there's a way to prioritise those improvements. Um, okay, uh, so I think. Um I think that with one of the three themes that has come through in the conversation to date, uh, today has been about integration and that early identification process. And I would say that it's really no different than in the, in the custodial setting. So I would say that an optimal kind of model or service model for supporting people with a serious mental illness or mental illness in custody is around um, that kind of early identification as they come into the system and doing that in an integrated way. So at the moment, we have multiple different types of assessments, clinical assessments even that happen in the system as people come in uh, to the system. Um, the information sharing across those assessments is, is a question that over time um, should be considered and addressed. Um, and then using that really, that assessment process um, to un and, and the assessment process should be geared towards, again, the psychosocial, the clinical, um, and any kind of legal uh, needs there might be. But essentially to understand what those needs are and to actually have an active plan about how those needs are, are um, addressed throughout the course of a sentence. Now, if we think about the comments earlier about very short sentences, it is near on impossible to address those issues in very short sentences because people need time to kind of adjust to being in prison. Then there's the issue of being transferred um, to the to the to various locations and moving across locations where the continuity of care might be broken. And then you have then the issue of by the time you've, you've kind of identified what the needs are, they're all ready to leave. So I think when we talk about the optimal care, we need to have the time and space to deliver it. We need to have um, an integrated approach, with, again, that's multidisciplinary, that takes into account security needs of a, of, of a custody setting. There's no doubt that, you know, those two things need to be balanced that, um, uh, in terms of mental health care needs and security needs, but actually to have the time and space to do it um, in a way that allows for the planning of people when they go back for their return to the community from the minute they come in. And I know we'll kind of address that a little later. The, quest, the critical question in that it becomes how do you do that when, you know, over 75% of our system have sentences of less than, you know, um, 12, 12 to 18 months and where really we don't have um, an integrated service response for serious mental illness. We've got our offending, our offending behaviour offence specific service responses. We've got our um, mental health responses. We've got our education and employment kind of responses. All of those currently operate in parallel. There needs to be a point at the entry into the system where those things are brought together and then there is an active process by which needs are monitored, um, acted on, and there is a, a dynamic and changing plan for that person as they move through their custody or their term of custody, including planning for their release. And is it possible among in identifying those various aspects to prioritise something at this point in time? Well, I think one of the things that um, 
So I think one of the things to kind of remember is that as, come, as people coming into prison, um, there's a whole bunch of, uh, of, of really complex factors that are in their lives at that time. So in some ways, in order for you to understand um, their needs and that assessment process at the outset, you also kind of need to deal with what they're leaving behind in the community. And sometimes that's understanding their connection with their family, understanding what their housing issues are, child support, um, you know, their Centrelink kind of a situation, really kind of really dealing with those emergency crisis needs at the outset so that they're not, for example, accumulating debts while they're in custody and then the, on the other end of their sentence, they've got a, a massive debt to deal with when they're back out in the community. But actually to deal with those crisis needs, then um, um, really dealing with those um, uh, mental health kind of therapy, mental health AOD um, offence specific needs because they become the key tools for that person to address further issues around how they sustain their own housing, how they build on their living skills, how they re-establish connections with their community, how they build employment opportunities for themselves and how they work with other agencies to kind of be empowered in that, in that um, journey of recovery. So I think there's people come into prison in a state of crisis, their lives are in crisis, and I think that has to be the number one priority. And then we really need to move on to those immediate therapeutic clinical needs because they are the ones that, you know, arguably can take the longest to address, um, but they also become those critical foundations for success in some of those other domains. In terms of um, youth, I'll only kind of speak to youth in the context of my experience with it in, as entry into the justice, into the adult system, because uh, that's where my experience is largely based. Um, there is a need to actually have a specific service response for youth that takes into account their developmental needs, the circumstances of their life, again, in a more integrated way, and to have actually a system that can, that thinks about the transition if someone is in the youth system and, in, in, and how we share information to support them if they move into the adult system. So um, again, at the moment, the systems kind of operate in silos. There is an opportunity to really uh, treat the system as one. It, you know, it's, obviously we don't want young people to end up in the adult system, but it's actually, they do, and we know they do. So it's really about how do we build a continuity across these two systems so that at every point there's an opportunity to um, uh, mitigate their further kind of they're becoming further entrenched in the system along the way. Um, shared models of care, um, you know, we've got a dual track system that operates. Could we have something like that in the mental health space? Um, what that might look like, I'm not sure, but I think actually thinking about that people 18 to 25 are that middle where they could be in either system and actually the two, the two systems really would need to work as one at that point. Um, can I move on to you? Yes, um, a couple of things, I suppose, just um, over the cup of tea break, thinking about it all, it really, um, and this question fits with that, it just highlights what we'd call the web of disadvantage that people are caught in. And again, we've talked a lot, as uh, Shame has just said, about the need for integration. So I suppose what um, stands out for me is thinking again about that situation in Norway where um, they had a reduced population that they were working with. I just suppose I want to use this opportunity to say we, we do have to look at all points of the system. We need to clear out the system of those 75 or whatever it is the shame has said, 75% of people who are in there on sentences less than 12 or 18 months. Um, like I think if, if we did that, which obviously involves, you know, led changes to legislation, et cetera. I think there are some structural things I just wanted to bring up at this point. Uh, and then I will get more specifically to that. But if we had lifted the age of criminal responsibility to 14, if we had a dual track system, for example, up to 25, and if we ensured that, for example, um, that people whose uh, criminal matters related mainly to their mental illness weren't in custody but were doing some other kind of, um, uh, involved in some other kind of community arrangement, we, we reduced the pool in custody at, to the extent that we can actually do something meaningful. So I just wanted to put it in that context. The only other thing I'll add to what's been said then is that um, I think we need to broaden the lens or the understanding of mental health 
uh, beyond the clinical. So, for example, our experience would be that the things, just like us, you and me, the, the things that impact on people's mental health are things like loneliness, lack of meaning and purpose, um, isolation, uh, physical amenity. Um, and again, the best jurisdictions will actually even look at the physical infrastructure. Uh, can people see out to the sky? Can they see trees? Um, etc. And I think we underestimate the impact of those uh, matters on people's mental health and well-being. Uh, we still pick up people um, from custody who are exiting straight from isolation, um, solitary confinement, whatever you want to call it, managed behaviour programs, but by straight from isolation into uh, our care. Uh, we pick up people who aren't able to, we picked up one Aboriginal woman who wasn't able to walk properly uh, because her muscles had um, atrophied while she was in isolation. So these, these matters, it's not necessarily what, asset, what clinical assessment someone's had, what treatment, therapeutic treatment they've had in terms of what medication or, these are actually the sort of things that affect all of us as human beings. <laughs> And I think we need to take that broader lens um, uh, when we're considering um, people's mental health. Connection to family, connection to culture, connection to nature, um, and yeah, connection basically in relationship. And, and specifically on young people, um, I think I probably the same, same would apply, uh, but particularly we need to, and, and some shifts have already started in the youth justice system now, but we, we would like to see no 10 to 14 year old uh, in custody. And we need to really do, um, uh, again, just what others have said, it's the absence of things like adequate housing, uh, engagement in education, all of those things that make someone more liable uh, to end up, for example, on remand rather than um, on bail in the community. So it's it's a broad answer, but it's basically saying you can't isolate just one uh, factor. You have to to look at the at the breadth of, of issues. But the main thing I'd like to say is a broader lens on what we consider um, as productive or conducive to mental health and well-being. Thank you, Ms. Edwards. Uh, Mr. Nicholson. Thanks. Um, again, I won't repeat what I think were very um, good point by, made by both, both my fellow um, panel members, um, but just a, a couple of things uh, in addition. First, I agree that sort of somewhat counterintuitively given the question, actually a massive investment in better community supports is gonna be the best way to provide better support in custody. Firstly, because you'll keep more people out and therefore particularly people on short sentences and therefore um, enable um, corrections and people working in the corrections and youth justice areas to really focus on those who are there, but also because it enables um, better reaching in of those services and managing transition right through someone's involvement in the justice system. Again, we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, I would say generally one of the big challenges we see is there's been such a um, rapid expansion of numbers in the correction system, and that hasn't been matched by a um, increase in the number of uh, the amount of treatment or and beds, particularly, um, obviously, Thomas Embling Hospital was designed at a time when we had a much, much smaller um, correction system and um, hasn't grown at the same pace. And the consequence we see of that is people that are very often in custody become unwell or because they're not getting the right treatment um, become more unwell and aren't able to plead to their matters. They become unfit to plead and then they get stuck in remand. So this cycle continues. So that um, increased access to uh, treatment for people who are very unwell is absolutely crucial because then you can start resolving their legal matters and getting them out of custody or into the right um, form of treatment faster. They may become, for example, with the right um, treatment, fit to plead again and then can get out on bail or resolve their matters and get back into the community with support. So um, likewise, in the youth justice system, We've seen um, real challenges with people getting the uh, right kind of support while they're on remand, and that can leave them on remand for a long period of time. So in terms of priorities, I think um, uh, expansion of Thomas Embling Hospital or similar 
um, is pretty crucial, a crucial part of this. Um, I think uh, the overcrowding in prisons and the use of um, lockdowns or solitary confinement or not sort of lockdowns or um, isolation um, is a major issue which um, should be addressed and uh, likewise have seen you know we've seen a number of ombudsman's reports about um, that and we've seen also very similar challenges in the youth justice system um, so uh, that addressing that partly through reduction of the number of people in custody but also the way that we manage them is a um, is a priority for us um, in in specifically in the youth system we have highlighted in our previous submissions in our work the kind of lack of access to services um, in the youth justice system but I would say that I um, since in recent weeks um, the 10-year youth justice plan has been released and that makes a number of recommendations about better access to mental health support um, in the youth justice system from courts right through to custody and forensic um, forensic beds and we think those recommendations if implemented go a long way to addressing some of those concerns um, and lastly i just uh, agree with the point about um, the, the young person transition into the adult system and more specific mental health services to support them in custody and in transitioning out it's crucial thanks Mr Nicholson, can I just um, stay with you for a moment and just pick up on a, a matter that was raised um, in previous discussion about a greater suite or access to voluntary treatment um, in custody? Is that something that you'd like to expand on? Yes, just to say, I mean, I think there's a discussion about what's the role of compulsory treatment in custody and voluntary treatment. And um, our view is that um, there should be increased access to voluntary treatment um, in custody, but that compulsory treatment, uh, there shouldn't be compulsory treatment in the um, in prisons, that it should be done through um, Thomas Embling Hospital or similar specialist um, facilities. And that's really for the simple reason that um, in our view, if the intention of um, compulsory treatment is to be recovery focused, but also to have um, as minimal uh, restrictions or rights restrictions as possible, that is just very difficult in a um, prison setting. That's our reason for that, for that view, in short. Thank you. Can I address, um, pick up on that question with you, Dr. El Khadi, and this is in relation to compulsory treatment in custody. Do you want to comment on that? Um, just briefly to, um, to say that, uh, and so I agree with sort of Dan's comments around, you know, the best place to provide mental health treatment um, is in a mental health facility or service. Um, but I, I guess I'd kind of go to the question that there is a lot of debate around compulsory retreatment in prisons. And um, it, it, the question, I guess, raises the issue of why, why, why is it there and why are we debating this and, and, and whether the question itself would be, uh, would be absent if we, have, um, if we had a mental health system that was able to better respond to the mental health needs of people in the justice system or ahead of them in, um, entering the justice system. Thank you. And Ms Edwards, is this something that you'd like to comment on? I hadn't commented on this previously. I think the, the points that have made are good in terms of definitely we'd like to see an increase in the voluntary service, uh, mental health services for people. But um, I just want to uh, support Dan's comment about uh, if someone is needing compulsory treatment, our view would be that that shouldn't occur in a custodial setting, as in in the prison where they are, it might need to be in a secure uh, facility, but uh, not in custody. Thank you, Ms. Edwards. Could I just stay with you for the moment? We're actually moving on to the um, the next and final topic, which is transi transitioning to and from custody. Again, um, I'm directing these questions at not only the adult system but also also the youth system. But if I could ask you sort of to address the first question in a broad way and then come to youth specific um, secondly. And the question is real, what are the optimal treatment and support um, needs for people with mental illness when they're going into custody and coming out of custody? Um, I think it goes back to probably some points that have been made generally, which is that um, Again, this as much as we can get holistic care and a real uh, accurate assessment of what the person's needs are, um, also that we need to be looking at 
um, and a number of this of, of, of us have said this, we need to be looking at the exit plan. Given that some people are in there for a matter of days, literally, um, I think it's not like they're there for two years. I think we need to start looking at the transition from the moment that people arrive. Um, and depends, sometimes we're talking about remand, sometimes we're talking about sentenced, but um, either way, people are often in custody for a very short period of time. Our experience, and it goes to what Dan said earlier, is that it's, it's short enough time, it's a long enough time to disrupt things like housing, um, and we would like to see shifts in that in terms of um, their tenancy not being unsettled. Um, but it's, it's a uh, short enough time to get almost no treatment in custody. So again, I, it's very difficult because you've got a flooded system, but it is true that we've also got 60 plus percent of people with mental illness in there. So, you know, it is hard when it's so overloaded to know what to do and when people are there for such a short time. But if, as we're told that everyone does get a thorough mental health assessment when they go in, then we need to really use from day one that um, opportunity, I suppose, to, to set out a plan for what is going to happen, either while they are in custody, but let's remember that many, we, we know from our own experience that even court ordered um, uh, participation in, in groups or in, in treatment in custody, it actually doesn't get to happen uh, because people are moved or they're into for too short a time, or in the youth space, it was, was more because there was a lockdown and the people couldn't get to groups. So, it, it, on paper, it could look very good, but in reality, it often isn't happening. So again, it depends whether you've got someone in there for 14 days, three months or whatever, but it's an opportunity, I suppose. Once they're there, what's the plan? And that's where, especially for short-term ones, the transition through to the community and the adequate planning um, uh, so that there's a continuity of care I can say in adult justice that has improved over the last year with sharing of some information that hadn't happened previously. We've been asking for years because we would pick someone up. They didn't know that they, they didn't know their own mental health plan. Um, and uh, they'd been told it, we were told, but they didn't know it and we weren't allowed to have it. So we weren't therefore able to support uh, people uh, in complying with treatment, in getting to appointments, etc., There has been a shift and an improvement with that. Um, so in other words, from the moment that someone arrives, we should be looking at what can we do in the 14 days or in the three months or whatever, but always with an eye on exiting um, and what can be put in place in the community. Um, again, for example, us doing the reconnect work and that's picking up people doing the transition we the idea is we're supposed to have up to six weeks before be able to be introduced to the person and begin that relationship it often doesn't happen again nobody's fault other than the overloading of the system and so sometimes we are meeting um, someone on the day that they are, are released it again just goes completely counter to the relationship based approach whereby we're trying to help them make a successful transition and to connect with uh, services out in the community. Um, I think they're the main points. With youth justice, what's happened now, which is good, is that there is one caseworker who would be uh, following the person inside custody and out. Um, now, I, that's a very small system relative to the adult system, so I'm not sure how that would translate, but it is a very good, a very good development that they, the young person um, doesn't start again with, um, you know, having someone new looking after them. One thing I wanted just to, to mention, I was conscious of the fact, for example, when we were in Norway, um, one corrections officer has, in, in a particular unit, will have three prisoners um, that he has a particular relationship with. So that's, rather than it be a, a very large setting, um, we think that, again, going to what I said about the broader lens of mental health, when you can have people in smaller units where they can have more meaningful engagement and have some relationships that are um, recogni recognising who they are, how they're going, uh, are aware that, you know, someone didn't turn up to see them, for example, or that they were slow to get out of bed or all of those things. When it can be smaller and more manageable and that you have a staff member with a particular eye on just a few people 
Um, we think all those sort of things, which are outside perhaps strictly what the treatment is, um, but they are the things that will help hold someone and help sustain them in a good state of mental health and well-being. Um, so again, often relationship-based. Um, one, one point I will make, which I haven't today, is about trauma. And I think that it's important, and this goes to the, the quality, I suppose, of the staff. We'd really want to see trauma-informed um, practice. We know that even with the men that I was talking about, we work, work with serious violent offenders and sex offenders, and um, most of those have are also victims of violence, for example. So if we're wanting to see a change, we think we need to be able to bring a trauma-informed uh, lens to our work. And of course, that goes to workforce. And my last comment about this will be, um, again, in the best jurisdictions that we saw overseas, uh, corrections officers uh, have a minimum of two years and are moving to bachelor degree qualifications. And systems do it differently. Some systems we saw have the security uh, staff, in a sense, on the boundary, but all those who are actually engaging with the prisoners in the day-to-day -day are social workers or educators or uh, have some other kind of uh, relevant qualification. And we saw other models where, in fact, the actual correction officers um, had that kind of uh, qualification. And I think that we can't underestimate the impact and importance of just the small day-to-day -day interactions outside of the clinical formal treatment plan that someone is on. So again, I'm going to the quality of the people, the quality of the relationship. Um, and of course, uh, we need um, sophisticated, evidence-informed um, mental health interventions. But I don't think it just sits within a white coat. I think it sits within the range of relationships and the range of activities uh, that a young person or an adult is doing in their day-to-day -day life as it would with you or me. Thank you, Ms. Edwards. Dr. Elkhardi, could I address that question to you? Um, we're on the topic of transitioning to and from custody. Um, so those people living with mental illness, what's the best possible care and support they can receive? Um, so I think, um, as kind of Julie uh, pointed out and we've pointed out on various occasions today, um, that the necessity and the, and, the, and the criticality of starting to plan for someone's release from the day they come in. And that transition planning, again, needs to be um, holistic and to understand the person um, from all angles, really. There are three elements, though, and layers of this that we need to think about. One is how do you do that for someone who's on remand? And a bit, we know that a big chunk of our system is now um, people on remand and what can you really do and what is, um, uh, what is a reasonable kind of transition plan when you don't actually even know when you're going to be leaving um, and whether actually people will be interested in having that conversation with you as someone providing that care. Um, the short sentences. Um, and again, what kind of reintegration planning can you do for someone on a very, on a very short sentence, sometimes only days? Um, so by the time you know when they're sentenced, they're kind of within days of leaving and what would be a meaningful uh, reintegration conversation to have there? And then the, the, the long sentences. And those would be the ones that I would say, you know, are subject to a potentially a parole period. And in that context, I think what we've seen over the past is an investment in that very um, pointy end, so the high risk, serious, violent and sex offenders, and not really actually thought about, um, in some ways, paying that investment forward for those that come into the system with serious mental illness early, whether they're on remand or on short sentences, and how we can provide um, a kind of a wraparound approach that extends well into community supports to enable them, um, to, well, to prevent that escalation into the more serious offending. And I think that's kind of what has been um, the, the challenge around the investment in reintegration is to actually, where are we going to get the best value and add for the community? Where are we going to get the greatest, the greatest community safety? Where are we actually going to get um, uh, a more cost-effective option and actually thinking about 
um, investing in that transition and reintegration planning for people on remand and on short sentences, as opposed to those that are, you know, in for very long periods of time. The other thing I'll add, add to that is that there is obviously a change in the um, parole application process and there's really not a good understanding just yet of how that has impacted people with a serious mental illness and ha have they been, um, uh, how, how do they apply for that process, are they disadvantaged in that process, what impacts on parole have there been for people with a serious mental illness if that is kind of uh, known and there is no data currently available about that and so then again it makes it difficult to plan uh, and affects that reintegration conversation because obviously from a parole perspective you need to have had a whole range of conversations around reintegration planning including where are you going to live, what treatment have you had, um, what are your supports outside, what's your risk if you go back into the community and um, uh, to understand how that's impacted people with serious mental illness is really important. Um, I think um, the, the transition needs to extend into the community. We've talked a lot about short sentences and some of these people really um, that get short sentences may be best served by community-based dispositions and not to forget that actually transition and reintegration needs to also happen for people on community-based dispositions. So we shouldn't assume that because someone is in the community that they are connected to the community. We shouldn't assume that they have the appropriate supports in place or that they can easily access them or that they even know where to go and what supports they need. So there is that kind of that continuity because of the trend and flow through the system that people with serious mental illness will struggle to kind of access the appropriate services in the system and we need to have a proactive approach that takes into account what their sentencing situation is, but actually not to assume that the supports are uh, it, it just is or more easily accessible if they actually came into the community and had a community-based disposition. And that transition and reintegration has the outcome of building community connection. That community connection needs to happen across all sentencing options. Can I just ask you, Doctor, in relation to any youth-specific aspects of transitioning? Well, yeah. Again, my my experience is mainly in the in the adult system, and that's been kind of you know it's a much much bigger system. But I also often think about there's, it is a small number of young people in the youth system relative, obviously, to the adult system, and how we can actually again uh, reverse that focus of the investment to that early those early stages, and actually extend it well into the community. Um, uh, their commun community supports and community release to make sure that um, they are supported in the long term. Again, we're talking about some very significant and complex mental health, family, psychosocial issues uh, that can't be dealt with with short-term reintegration options. Thank you, Dr. Mr. Nicholson. Thanks. I should say this is an area of service delivery we're less involved in. We certainly see uh, the consequences of our failure in this area because the people who come back uh, into custody or into the criminal justice system are the people that we see. Um, so I'll just uh, say that first. Um, I think, look, I agree with the comments about transition um, starting on the day someone enters custody or indeed um, before and um, working with them uh, throughout their involvement in the um, non-custodial community areas, custody and then back out into the community. Um, there's a major challenge about lack of planning and support and supervision as people exit into the community and the um, significant reduction in the number of people who get parole is part of that, that we see fewer people being uh, released on supervision than they were before. So the combination of reduction in the number of people getting parole um, in Victoria and the short sentences means that more than ever people are released kind of cold into the community um, with limited supports. And so that makes the that early transition planning um, more important than ever. Um, there are lots of things that one could talk about in this area, and I won't repeat what Dr. Elkadi said and, and um, Ms. Edwards has said, but I think access to housing in transition is one thing I would just um, highlight. We see a very high number of people accessing homelessness services, I believe it may be as high as 50% uh, in the time after release from prison, and it's difficult to see how someone um, experiencing mental health issues could possibly get um, other decent care and supports and um, really engage in recovery uh, without 
adequate housing available. And that in reality is the situation that a number of people, are, a very large proportion of people are being exposed to on release. So I would absolutely put housing um, very close to the top of the list of supports that people need and an investment which would, um, given the cost of incarcerating people, um, more than repay itself very quickly. Um, the other thing I would just note is we see a particular issue with people um, on custodial supervision orders in Tom Assembling, transitioning into the um, non-custodial system and into the civil mental health system. So the um, gaps in step down um, supervision and service delivery for that particular um, cohort of clients. It's not something um, Dr. Elkhardi already addressed, but um, the way that people transition from Tom Assembling into um, the civil mental health system, I think is a crucial piece of work to also, um, uh, in order to get more flow through the system, but also support people to recover and um, return to the community. Yes, Ms. Edwards. Um, I got a bit carried away with what happens inside and didn't really answer the transition side of things, which was the heart of the question. So if you don't mind, I just want to go back and make just one or two comments, um, uh, which is um, just particularly there's two there's a few things about housing and accommodation just this week we have starting a trial um, where Maribyrnong Detention Centre has been um, uh, transferred to uh, instead of being for um, people seeking asylum is being used for people exiting custody it's a COVID related response because we know that between 40 and 50 percent of people exiting custody exit into homelessness uh, and because of COVID-19, the idea was there was a desire to do something different. So um, that is being used to starting the first person is arriving there from custody on Friday uh, and they will house 44 people. Um, what inadvertently this is giving us is an opportunity to trial something that we've long been wanting to trial, which is step down um, accommodation. Uh, for people exiting custody and they can be there for up to six months. They may be there a lot shorter But um, what we need is that sort of um, very, very interesting to see how that goes into um, for The evaluation of that, but we need places where people who would be um, otherwise exiting into homelessness can go and be supported and in a sense, it is, it is a step down because from there, further work will be done to actually find longer term housing options to make sure that treatment around mental health in the community um, has actually transferred to the community, that they are connected with the services they need. It, that might be for a month, two months, three months or up to six months. So it's really a, a, a safety uh, valve in there, I suppose, to make sure that that transition is smoother. So I think they're the sort of things, but that's just one example. We need a range of, of, of housing options, especially when we know about that percentage. The other thing I'll just mention is the importance, again, of family and community. Um, we know that the uh, if there's any likelihood of keeping keep people connected with their family and community, that's one of the greatest safeguards in terms of their um, mental health and in terms of um, not reoffending. So I think in terms of when people are making that transition, we've got to do as much as we can while people are in custody to make sure they're connected. And for Aboriginal people, that is particularly the case. And uh, there's a few things I'd say there that one is that there is often an assumption that Aboriginal people will return to family and community and they want to, and usually that's something that everybody wants, but there has been harm done at times and again I'd say this restorative approach work needs to be done while the person's in custody to address the uh, harm done to address the uh, barriers to successful reintegration and connection back with family and community because otherwise they're brought there they're dropped there and in fact there'll be a blow up because the underlying issue wasn't resolved. So just um, we're trialling at the moment Jesuit Social Services involved more in the youth custody space with um, some restorative interventions. It's not through the courts, it's actually just using a restorative approach with family and community while the person is in custody to help that transition back into the community um, more seamless. Thank you. Mr Nicholson. Uh, yes, and we strongly support that, um, the restorative justice practices too. Just look, I, I feel like I may have um, 
been strong on the problem identification and not so much on the solutions in my previous answer. So all I'd say is I think there are successful um, programs like the Judy Lazarus um, Centre and Forensic Air's Tambo program in existence, which are doing a pretty good job of um, transition. So that the issue may be to scale up those existing successful programs rather than having to um, build something completely new. And again, I think um, this is probably something that's come through more generally in the Royal Commission's um, uh, investigations and something we see a lot in the criminal justice system. We can become a land of pilots uh, here in Victoria and we do have a number of successful programs that simply need the investment um, to scale them up and make them a, a more um, permanent and widespread part of the, of the um, system. Thank you, Mr Nicholson. Um, Ms Edwards, could I just come back to you for a moment and just touch on, this is the final topic that we'll be addressing, but it's something that both you and Dr Okadi have addressed and it's the, the information sharing aspect of um, treatment and support. Um, and, you, and you commented that more recently things have improved in that space. Can you just briefly describe how that is and perhaps how things could be better improved? Yes, look, I'm, I'm not necessarily going to have the specifics of it, but I know we worked with uh, Justice Health, as did others for a long time, to make sure that there would be better sharing of health and mental health information when someone's exiting custody. Uh, that was for years we were just getting nowhere and now we do get a summary report. I can't, I haven't, can't speak to the detail of that, but it has allowed us to improve um, uh, the care of people as they transition from custody because we, even for example, what medications people are on, um, and often the, in the past, the actual person, the person exiting custody, would be wanting us to have that information, but we weren't able to, to get it. So it wasn't like they were giving permission for us to have it, but we weren't getting it. So now that's improved. I don't have the detail other than to say um, our staff tell us it's made a big difference in being able to actually help the person access the treatment, the medication uh, and other services that they need. Thank you, Ms. Edwards. Uh, Dr. Alcardi, did you want to comment further on that topic? Uh, yeah, thank you. So the information that now, um, as I understand it, gets shared is the discharge plan that, um, that gets shared with the Reconnect service providers, um, which Julie's is referring to. Um, I think there is an issue around um, how we share information in the system within, within the system and then into the community. And I think they're actually um, some of that is because of archaic systems where we've got, you know, multiple systems in multiple places recording different pieces of information and not kind of a single source of truth. Uh, and it's also uh, um, a factor of possibly different understandings of what can be shared under what legal provisions. And, you know, I'm not a legal expert, but I can certainly recount many conversations where there have been questions about whether we can share um, information, what can be shared um, in the process of supporting someone's either treatment or transition back into the community. I think one of the things that um, we shouldn't forget is also the information sharing between places like correctional facilities or even um, Tom Assembling or Forensic Care's Community Mental Health Services and Area Mental Health Services. Ultimately, um, either people will start at the Area Mental Health Service and um, uh, by, by some trajectory end up with forensic care or the reverse will also be true. They'll come out into the community or be subject to a community-based program, a non-custodial supervision order where the treatment may have initially started with forensic care, then has moved into an area of mental health services. So to be able to share information um, across systems, I think the critical point is a lack of clarity about what can be shared and the, the, the infrastructure doesn't support it. So it, it can often be a, a very tedious, onerous, lengthy process to negotiate what can be shared, how, in what form. Um, and, in some and in some cases, you kind of don't know what you don't know. So there is a risk there in that we're only getting a slice of the pie about a person when actually um, to help their recovery and to, to manage their safety in the community, we should really have a more comprehensive view and a, and a clearer understanding of that person, whether it's from prison-based prison information um, or area mental health services or other community supports that that person may have been some, um, receiving. Thank you. Um, 
just finally, Mr Nicholson, is there anything you'd like to say on this topic? No, nothing, nothing further to add. Thank you. That, that concludes the questions that I have to ask the panel members today. Very grateful for your uh, participation and contribution. I'll hand over to the chair now, um, who will invite the commissioners to ask questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Ms Coughlin. Um, thank you all very much for the conversation and for your very informative witness statements. I think um, we can be left in no doubt there is a strong mutual interest between the criminal justice system and the mental health system in improving outcomes for consumers with mental illness. And I think um, what's clear is that we've got a growing dimension of an issue, not a reducing one. And Dr Elkadi, thank you for some of the material in your um, witness statement where you highlighted in one point, you know, we've had over the last decade, 3,000 extra police recruited and deployed. Um, weekend courts have opened. Um, you talked about new magistrates have been appointed and we've had a very substantial growth in prison infrastructure and prison numbers um, as a result of all of that. You also talk about the fact that the diversion rate has uh, reduced from 25.6% to 12.5%. The prison population has grown by 70% in that period, um, of which 40% are estimated on remand. Um, and there's been a de decrease in parole rates by 61%. So some of the things that you've all advocated for um, have been a stronger emphasis on diversion, stronger um, response, for example, Mr Nicholson, you talked about the value of problem-solving courts that demonstrated efficacy. They haven't grown proportionately to those other investments that have been described. Um, you know, so there's a strong, I think, fundamental design about how you get these balance in this system that we've known about for a very long time, a bit like the introductory comments I made, these are not new. The understanding about this has been there for a very long time. But you still have, and um, just going further on to your witness statement, Dr Alcardi, you do talk about the fact that you still, however, in 2020, um, have, a, in 2020, we still have a system where Corrections is largely focused on the risk of reoffending, and the area mental health services are focused on treatment. And you note that these two objectives are not always aligned, and that you suggest, therefore, what is needed is a shared understanding of mental health and offending behaviour risks and how they impact each other. And I think that's absolutely fundamental in terms of us thinking about the ongoing management of this these issues. Can you give me a sense of how you think we could develop that shared understanding? What would be an approach that might be taken to improving that understanding across both the criminal justice system and the mental health system? Jeez, that's a tricky question. Um, I think, I think... <laughs> All of our questions now are tricky. I'm trying to make the point that some of the other issues we've known mm. about, we just haven't been able to to, to address them in a sustained way. So maybe this is one of the ones that's at the yeah. heart of why not. Well, I think, I think, I think one of the things that um, kind of I, I've experienced in, in conversations around some of those um, disparate understandings of what, which risk am I managing? Am I managing the risk of um, mental illness or am I managing risk of reoffending comes down to a structural issue around how the services are designed and what they see as their roles and responsibilities. So, you know, it is, it is you know, and, and it is no one's fault that at an area mental health service, they'll say, my main focus is their mental health. If their mental health is stable and they're offending, then that's, that's not my issue. Um, if their um, mental health is not stable, then we can have a conversation about what, what um, impact that will have on their risk of reoffending. But often there's no action that can be taken until they reoffend. And that's kind of, and so we end up kind of stuck in this, well, whose responsibility is it? So I think this kind of points to the comments that I was kind of making earlier about actually having joint teams and people working together for people that are in the system. So, and, and actually some shared kind of targets and goals and objectives and a shared definition of what success looks like. Because I think if you ask those two streams of service, as an example, they would, their, their definition of what success looks like for them is, would be quite different. 
but it's actually about bringing them together and actually um, uh, under, and, and looking at what is, if the person is in the centre, what is it that they need? And they will need a bit of everything. They will need support from the mental health service. They will need to be supported through offence specific interventions. They will need to be supported through housing and all of those things. It's about actually how we bring the services together. Uh, and it's it's tricky because it's hard to kind of step back from when you're on autopilot in, in delivery of services to kind of understand, well, how do I consider what the correction space is thinking about? And we, the, the critical example we see in that is when people are discharged straight into emergency departments on inter, inpatient assessment orders and health services kind of not really knowing what to do with someone who's got a serious mental illness but seems to be kind of stable but they've been sent there to, for further assessment into the community. But actually they're not, they've served their sentence, they've not reoffended. Um, they're not sort of unwell enough to be admitted and so they get discharged and you, and you hear some of those also those frustrations from police about we send people to emergency departments and then they just get released into the community. Everyone is operating in the silo of their role and responsibility without putting and the person needs to be at the centre. So can I just take that a little bit further because one of the challenges clearly is we've got a very significant number of individuals who are engaging in both these service systems at various points and I think your summary about how that plays out is, is very true, which when do they become part of the responsibility of the mental health system or the criminal justice system and when are they um, in such circumstances that it needs that coordinated approach and the reality is the coordinated approach will often be most intense for the most at risk and high risk people. Um, if you think about the trends that we've observed, they've largely been driven by very serious adverse events, serious offending, harm, significant harms to others and the broader community safety. You do talk about the problem behaviour program that's run by forensic care as being an example of where you target a high risk group and have presumably um, shared planning and intervention. Um, what scope do you think there is about the importance of that sort of function performed by forensic care? Because I presume it's relatively small at the moment. Yeah, it's quite a small program. It's staffed by about 12 clinicians um, and it is essentially a statewide service and it is limited uh, to people in the community. So it doesn't obviously extend into the prison um, system, but it is, it is essentially a specialist one-on-one -on -one service, particularly catered for people who have, who demonstrate high risk, a high or moderate risk in those problematic behaviours, error, arson, pedophilia, sexual offences, violent offences. So it is a small program in scope, um, but I think there's actually a bit more of a role that we can play in in um, making that making the community more or community agencies more aware of that service. At the moment, the bulk of our referrals come from community corrections uh, for people on parole or on community-based dispositions. But we also in that program can take self-referrals. We can take referrals from private providers and and police. So there's kind of been a little bit of a nervousness about how we how how broadly we kind of make this program known because you know do you open the floodgates and then how do we deal with demand, but actually there's also a conversation about how much do people uh, how much in that diversion early intervention space do people know about that service and how can we actually really pitch it as a you know really a statewide service with outreach into regional areas in, included where we can kind of address some of these behaviours in their earlier stages and not wait until we end up with a high risk um, offender. So that may well be something of interest for us to follow up in terms of the potential because clearly earlier intervention while people are in the community before very serious offences are committed mm. is something I think we're all motivated to see what else mm. can be done to try and change that dynamic. Yes, yeah, certainly so, I think that would be an opportunity. Mm. Um, do any of the other panel members want to comment on that before I hand over to Professor McSherry? Um, I'd just like to say something, Chair. Um, I think completely accept uh, the proposition that it depends uh, what we're employed to do or which department we're sitting in or how we see the problem. Um, how we're defining the problem is then the response that is going to be given. And 
I suppose that goes to the point, I think um, there are, as, as you were uh, indicating, Chair, there are some people who's uh, seen as so high risk that in fact we will sometimes get that multidisciplinary panel around them, whether it be through MACNI or MAPSING or whatever, we can do that. But that's going to be, given the, the volume of, of people that we're talking about, that's actually only going to touch a small percentage probably, which brings me back to the workforce development issue. I really think that we need to um, broaden or ensure that the that the staff we've got can work across those domains, that they actually understand um, the, the legal requirements uh, and the justice requirements, uh, they understand the mental health needs and they understand probably a range of other things that are social needs. Oftentimes we see people who are getting the clinical care but that have had no, nobody's picked up that they're homeless, nobody's picked up that they're completely isolated, they're just treating them with the lens that they, the, uh, the specific lens which through which door they've come. So I think we have to really do that as well. And I, I one other point in case it doesn't um, come up later and it's connected with this, is I suppose I just wanted to raise the issue of um, borderline personality development uh, disorder uh, in that our own experience, we have a number of uh, people who, especially young people, who have um, a range of problems and uh, they come, mental health problems. They may have come to us actually through that or they may have come through the justice system, but the justice system um, uh, engagement has actually been quite minimal. That hasn't been the major thing, but they have um, serious problems. And when we have tried to get the help for them in the mental health system, we haven't been able to. And I'm talking about serious, you know, trying to suicide every day, um, uh, threatening to hurt people, etc. So we've been offering care and we have not been able to get the care because we're told, you know, it doesn't fit the criteria around mental health or it's behavioural or it's, it's something that doesn't fit the the act and they're not allowed to we also understand that they're saying we can't detain this person so i just really want to raise it because those some of those people have gone on to commit the very very serious offenses actually and they just weren't meeting certain thresholds and i'm not saying there's a lot but they're often when they do commit an offense it's a very serious one and in fact they've been whichever language you want to put on it, seriously unwell for a long time, but the, the service offering to respond to that just hasn't been there. Thank you. Mr Nicholson. Yeah, just to add it um, to that point, I think my colleague Tim Marsh, who um, acts for a number of the people charged with the most serious offences where there's often a crime mental impairment um, uh, element to the, uh, to the case, uh, he says that in all his time talking to families, no one's ever said this came out of the blue. Uh, on the contrary, it's largely come because they've been trying to get them into various services and interventions and haven't been able to do that uh, over time. Um, and I think, you know, we've seen in some of the, our most um, complex clients that have got um, significant mental health issues, but also other, um, you know, significant um, intellectual disabilities or other disabilities, that there may be that um, we've seen cases where there's that intense intervention in custody, but once the person's then released into the community, that sort of weekly panel meeting may fall away that was really providing that support. So actually you end up with less support in the community than you had in custody, which seems to me to be the wrong way around uh, with the investment. Um, just the last thing I'd say more generally, going away from all the acute cases, I think the thing that the mental health system and the justice system or to try and have in common is this idea that they can be a moment of intervention in someone's life to assist recovery. And I think if you look at recovery as a broad concept of not just treating the mental health, um, uh, you know, the, the, the mental health issues with medication or whatever, but helping people to live their most productive lives, that's absolutely the role of the criminal justice system at that early stage of being a moment of intervention to address the underlying causes of offending. And that's the common thread that we need to get between those two systems. Uh, in those very many cases that aren't at the most acute end. Yes, um, and I think probably um, the point I was um, making there was more, you get the community license to deal with some of those other large volume matters and to do exactly what you're suggesting, Mr Nicholson, if you also deal well with the very serious end. 
Completely um, agree. and try and prevent some of those harms that have driven some of the dynamics we're seeing currently. So um, a very good reminder though about the need to have the balance at both ends of the spectrum. So Professor McSherry, would you like to ask? Uh, yes, I have a question for, um, I think first up, Ms Edwards, um, you, you mentioned, I think uh, it's paragraphs 41 and 42 of your, your statement. You talk a little bit about um, the framing in uh, relation to youth justice in particular. And uh, some of the data we've received as commissioners has been quite concerning in relation to the youth of uh, the use of restraints and uh, seclusion on young people in mental health facilities, and that raises concerns about um, the whole sort of occupational health and safety and risk framing in relation to to young people. And I know that there are some general attitudes out there in relation to young people in particular that. Um, Discipline, a firm hand uh, is important and therefore there's this legal framework that, that's set up around, you know, discipline, deterrence, community protection and, and safety and so on. Um, and you, you mentioned that there's, there hasn't been a clear vision in relation to rehabilitation. And in some, um, to some extent, I think that may flow down from the adult um, system in that even looking at the sentencing principles in the, the Sentencing Act, you have uh, to punish is the very first guideline, the purpose of the Act. And then you have deterrence, community protection, denunciation. And there's only one um, guideline that talks about uh, enabling, I think, conditions for rehabilitation. There's nothing about to rehabilitate the offender. So I'm really interested in your perceptions here and particularly in relation to this intersection uh, for young people with very severe mental health conditions and in particular your experience in Norway, um, how this principle of, of normalcy works that you refer to in your statement and whether that carries over in relation to young people with mental health conditions. Thank you. Um, yes, I've got uh, both Norway and Spain were in my mind as um, as you uh, uh, spoke. Uh, perhaps I'll go first to the Spain experience because straight away I started smiling because as we travelled around Europe and were looking at um, these uh, facilities which were um, very good in lots of ways in Norway and in Germany and in other places, and they would show us, um, here is the room when someone needs to, has been self-harming or is it um, a risk to themselves or to, or to uh, others. Here's, here's the room and you'd see it and they'd show you that the, the you know, um, you know, no hanging spots and, you know, all of we can imagine, you know, the toilets behind that can't be seen and there's the low um, window that people can look in, etc., etc. Anyhow, so when we were seeing these very proudly being shown to us in all the places we visited, when we got to Spain and we started looking at some of the youth justice facilities, it was just because really we've seen them everywhere else. So I said, where's the, you know, the room you remove someone to? Where's the isolation room, you know, if someone's at risk to themselves or to, and they, they actually didn't understand the question. And I said, what do you mean? I'm saying, well, you know, if someone uh, you know, it was on suicide watch, what would you do? And that, they literally didn't. And then they went, their bedroom. Do you, do, and then they said, do you mean to say you would actually, are people actually taking them out and they're isolated, they're struggling, they're suicidal, and they put them in a room like what? They said, no, they would be in their bedroom. And in fact, uh, we would put the person they are most connected with, staff or other young person in there with them because that's, that's what they need. They, it's sort of like the human response. They, so they didn't have these special rooms and that just came to mind as, as you said that. Um, uh, and I, that, that really struck me. But for example, in Norway, with the, uh, the principle of normalcy, um, what that meant was that that was reflected, you know, in, from everything from their vision about rehabilitation, re-socialisation, re-education, and our youth justice system is now 
uh, has a clearer vision uh, than it did. And as, as um, Dan said, the um, new strategy was just released two weeks ago. Um, but it went from from everything, from the vision, and therefore everyone was there for, for that purpose. And that's why, therefore, staff are trained to a certain level. You know, they're educators. They brought it through to the physical infrastructure of the building and, uh, and they were pleasant places to be. They were very conscious of the fact of artwork, um, of the views that you get out the window, etc. Uh, the amenity. So in, in uh, normalcy, the idea was they are citizens, so their punishment, <coughs> excuse me, is the deprivation of their liberty. That's it. Everything else is not supposed to be punitive. Um, and in some of the places we went, for example, while there would be some health practitioners in the facility, really the health service was provided by the local community because the idea is they're citizens, they're entitled to the health care that everybody else has. And so the GPs, etc., would come in from outside in from outside in to provide that like they would in any any other um, uh, place they were living. So um, that that was important in terms of that. But I think again the um, going back to this to the Spanish example it, it just struck me that sometimes we forget the person and what a person might need at a time like that. And the fact that they couldn't even understand our question to me was, was very interesting. I've probably got a little bit sidetracked because my mind went back to those things. Have I answered your question or is there anything else you wanted from? Um, um, yes, no, that, that answers it very well. Cause I, I think it's that balancing between the, you know, the punishment and the denunciation and the rehabilitation that, that sometimes gets lost when, and particularly when we talk about young people. But that brings me on, if, if I may, just um, and ask one more question to Mr. Nicholson, who you mentioned um, consumer led or, or designed um, processes and programs. We've certainly been, been looking uh, at that across the, the mental health system. I'm just wondering, are there vehicles at the moment to ensure the, the voice of um, the people themselves, particularly young people, can be heard and, and so that their stories um, actually get out there to the community? Yeah, there are some. I mean, I think as a general proposition, uh, no doubt in your um, deliberations and investigations, you've heard a lot about um, consumer leadership and the importance of that, of that in the mental health system. In the criminal justice system, it is um, far less developed uh, in general. Um, I doubt there would be a single um, major criminal justice organisation that would have a dedicated consumer leadership role, and, and that includes uh, legal aid. Um, we have uh, consumer leadership roles in relation to our mental health services, but not specifically focused on our criminal justice services. So there's a lot of uh, way to go in that respect in, in criminal justice. And I would say generally that is reflected in a system which is too often designed around lawyers and judicial officers and others and not around the actual users of the system that plays out in practice in the way the courts operate, in my view. So there's a lot of work to do to reorient that system with the user at the centre and to listen to consumer voices. Um, and I think there are some encouraging examples. I think um, there's some good work done in the youth justice custodial um, environment now with uh, young people's groups, I've forgotten the name, but um, where people are, are heard. Uh, and so there are, um, is that opportunity for participation. There's been some work done um, through the Women um, Transforming Justice Project to train up um, consumer uh, leaders in that context and also through the recent transforming justice work um, done at uh, Centre for Innovative Justice um, focused on people with prisoners with acquired brain injury. So there are some green shoots if you like um, uh, but I think there's a lot more that could be done. Thank you. If we can now go Dr Cochran. Thank you. Um, my question is to Mr Nicholson, um, and it's really um, trying to understand at the problem solving court and processes how to create um, a more comprehensive and integrated approach at that 
um, point in the in the cycle. Um, understandably, you were recommending more widespread and more universal access to those programs across um, different Victorian jurisdictions. But I guess I'm trying to understand that if we've got um, problem solving courts that have been uh, separated by either issues like AOD or by cultural aspects or by age or by, there obviously isn't one for particularly people um, experiencing mental illness as part of their, their process. Um, and given we understand the intersectionality where people experiencing mental illness may well be part of some of those other um, already defined problem solving processes. I'm trying to understand is the segregation to a specific siloed system versus a more integrated approach like the CISP and other things which way here is a better way to go to make sure that people's um, preceding and ongoing issues around um, experiencing mental illness are appropriately addressed through the criminal justice system in that context? Have you got some thoughts on that? Yeah, it's, a gr it's a great question and something that we've thought about a lot in the context of um, how you make the system overall more problem solving or more, more therapeutic, whatever your preferred choice of words is. So I mean, first there, there is the ARC list, which is specifically focused on people with um, mental health issues and that relate to their offending. So there is that, again, it's available only in uh, Melbourne, uh, down the southeast of Melbourne and in mm. uh, Gippsland. So um, limited take up. Um, look, there have at various points been projects to try and transform courts as a whole and bring together those more problem solving approaches. There are probably um, those projects have never um, entirely got off the ground uh, and the funding investment hasn't come through for those over the years. Um, so that's why we would tend to favour rather than waiting for the perfect solution to expand what we have that we know works. I accept the point that um, in an ideal world, you would build uh, a court system where the mainstream, you know, every court user, um, had an, had an interventional response which was based around the issues in their life um, and helped them to address it. That would be the ideal. But I think, um, so that's something we need to work towards. But I think we haven't, um, we found it difficult to deliver that. And it is a very big task given the demand pressures on the magistrates court in particular to make that change. So that, that's why we would support beginning by expand, expanding what's there. And as I said, I think that does actually help in the mainstream, mainstreaming process, if you like, if you want to call it that, because then suddenly in every court you have um, support workers, magistrates, legal aid lawyers, police prosecutors who are working in that more problem solving way. And it may be that at the back end of the system, the support workers, it does look more integrated rather than sort of strictly separated programs. Um, so yeah, I, it, I don't think there's any perfect answer to your question. We have erred on the side of that approach because we think that's what's um, more immediately achievable in the short term um, while you work towards that long term uh, integration piece. Just, and this is my lack of knowledge yep. um, completely, but um, is it the case that if there are lists running in the specialist courts that general magistrates rotate through them? So do all magistrates get exposed to those no, they specialist don't. courts? No, they don't. So you have a specialist magistrate that sits in right. drug court. And that's very important because a huge part of the um, success of the model is the relationship that you build with the magistrate. Indeed, I went to a drug court graduation where someone who'd, um, it was last year, and to give you an indication, this person had started in Pentridge Prison at 18. So that would tell you how long they'd been involved in the criminal justice system, given they uh, were at one point housed in Pentridge. Um, and they, one of the things they said was, I've never had a relation, in all those times I've been to court, I've never built a relationship with a judicial officer before. Uh, and they had in the course of the two years in drug court. So that's a very important part of it. But of course, um, as you have more of these programs, more magistrates do tend to rotate through the programs for extended periods, you know, not one week at a time, but it certainly increases the contact of the um, judicial officers and 
as I said, and legal aid lawyers and police prosecutors with those more problem solving ways of working, which are very different to the high paced um, mainstream of the courts. Thank you. Um, Professor Fells. Uh, I have one main question. If there's time, I had a couple of smaller ones. Um, and by the way, I'd like to thank all the witnesses for their excellent statements and for their comments this morning. On the uh, question of community attitudes, uh, I found your discussion good but somewhat dispiriting, of course, and notwithstanding a comment by Ms Edwards that we need some leadership in this situation from politicians and so on. Um, but I wondered if I could come at it from another angle, also a bit dispiriting, um, and see what you have to say. Um, community safety, what can you offer us that would make us feel a bit safer? Uh, and also, um, you know, in, in all the things you're saying, um, and also, um, what would be um, convincing to people who are mainly interested in community safety? That's a bit different from objectively what would improve safety, but what would work in persuading um, the community safety minded people uh, that the reforms are good? And um, also, um, if you're taking the community safety aspect would your priorities maybe be any different um uh, i think i have to address it to one person maybe maybe mr nicholson i was hoping you'd address it somewhere else first so i had a moment to gather my thoughts um I mean, I think one of the challenges is the exclusive focus on safety and not on what makes us a fair and more just society uh, in criminal justice, because uh, actually um, we've seen just this weekend in the middle of a pandemic, uh, enormous protests, you know, looking at with a real focus on Aboriginal incarceration and deaths in custody. And that's about ending inequality in our society. So the more that we can frame it not ex exclusively in terms of safety, um, the more opportunity there is in the conversation. Uh, look, at risk of repeating myself, I'd just say this, we've learned in the past three months that if we follow the evidence uh, and do things that might not immediately seem attractive, we can together keep the community safe. And what we'd be asking in criminal justice is, again, follow the evidence, work together as a community to do those things that will actually keep the community safe, not necessarily the things that we may uh, all want to do at any given point or want to happen to others. And uh, to me, that's the uh, crucial learning from the past few months that we can apply into the discussion about criminal justice and, um, and people experiencing mental health conditions. Just lastly, just briefly, we also forget how quickly the conversation about mental health turned around because of leadership and examples. I mean, I'm a North Melbourne supporter. I remember going to the football when a North Melbourne supporter first disclosed um, uh, experiencing severe depression and the things that were shouted out for the first month in the crowd were the most despicable things, but you would never see that only 10 years later. So I think things can actually turn around quickly with the right examples and the right leadership. Um, um, so can I just ask a follow up question on that, Professor Fells, and I'll come back to you and it maybe takes sure. a little bit from what Ms Edwards also said. The place of engaging through restorative justice and having victims sometimes be the advocates for some of these changes, what scope in relation to improved understanding and uh, I'm, I'm just building on your theme of a more fair and just society if you have the restorative justice practices that Ms Edwards was recommending, would you also potentially have more advocacy on behalf of victims for a balanced response? I mean, I can absolutely quickly respond to that, which is I think that the two, two of the big changes to make the criminal justice system more user-centred are problem-solving approaches and restorative justice processes. And I don't, that those two things can go hand in hand and they will make the biggest difference in getting buy-in from everyone in the, um, in, the, in the community 
to the um, to the kind of interventions that actually work. So yes, I. Professor Fells, do you want to go on? Yeah. Um, second, um, uh, a lot has been said by all the witnesses about families and carers, and uh, Julie Edwards, towards the end, said some very specific things, but. Even to milk the subject a bit further, um, is there more that could be done beyond what you said uh, to get a better engagement of families and carers in this um, situation? Um, maybe Julie Edwards, although it was mentioned by all, including Dr. El Thank you. Um... Yes, I think the reality is by the time it comes to the attention of the, the various systems or the, the uh, interconnected systems of criminal justice and mental health, for example, we're talking about something that isn't a surprise that families have probably been struggling with for quite a long time and are probably quite bruised by at this stage. So um, usually, um, families haven't walked away, uh, but they have um, been feeling like they're banging their head up against a wall, really, to get the kind of care uh, that they that they need. So um, I suppose I just situated in that it's not like I think families are wanting to disengage. Mostly, I think they're just at their wits' end, um, and I think sometimes then <clears throat> there are, and whether it's restorative. Um, but we need to have sometimes mediated conversations um, with family and with the person. We can, we can call it restorative justice interventions, but we're actually doing some pro problem solving about what's needed. And sometimes with family, it's, it's the, the best thing is, for example, that they aren't the place where the, where the person is living, um, but that they are able to maintain a relationship in the long term. Um, again, our experience would be that families, as I say, aren't wanting to walk away, but really they need also to be supported and resourced to do it. And it is often the best link that a, a person who is caught up in the criminal justice system who has a mental health problem um, needs, but there needs to be support at that level too. And they're usually not, they're usually not supported. And, uh, you know, they often are the subject of, you know, perhaps violence at times or, um, uh, people not complying with medication, etc., and families just need that extra level of support. Um, final uh, question, um, meant to be a short one to Mr. Nicholson, um, who, amongst others of you, commented on NDIS, and I didn't fully understand all because I was just wondering if you could give us a moment's dummy's guide to NDIS. Um, when it applies, when it meant to apply, when it's not meant to apply, and uh, other aspects of it and prisons. Yeah, uh, so the justice. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I mean, I'm happy to provide some more material in writing given the time. I guess my, the, the short thing I would say is it's, part, it's partly about uh, access to the scheme, but a large part of it is we have a number of clients who have significant NDIS packages but there are very thin markets, if you like, for people with justice involvement, which is a, a technical way of saying they can't get, they can't pay anyone to do the work for them anymore. As soon as they get into prison, um, they uh, their providers will um, won't continue to work with them, basically. And so there's a very um, uh, there's a lack of uh, proper services, even people who have packages to actually access the care they need. And so and that was a known problem uh, when NDIS was set up, that there would be thin markets in regional areas, but also thin market for certain complex clients and those with justice involvement. Unfortunately, nothing properly has been done to provide a provider of last resort or providers of last resort who would um, assist people. So that's really the challenge. It's, an, it's a known issue that simply sadly wasn't addressed. And there are providers, a small number of providers in the justice system that can help but the current funding model simply doesn't work for them. So it's just a matter of investing in providers of last resort. 
that's, I mean, uh, there are a bunch of other issues which I can give you further information in, but that's about, but that's really the, the main issue that I've, um, I've been dealing with. So literally, we'll have people who have supports, they assault someone in the community, they're remanded in custody, and they can't get bail because their service provider won't help anymore. And there's no criticism of the service providers who aren't set up for it, but um, it's just a, a classic situation of market failure. Thank you. Thank you, um, and thank you all very much for your time today. I think you have highlighted for us where some of the big challenges sit in terms of our service system design, given our remit is around the design of a reformed mental health system, but we can't have that a system given the prevalence of the interface with the justice system and in particular the criminal justice system without reconciling how these two systems have to work together into the future. And I think it was today's conversation has also said we've put consumers at the centre of our redesign system, those living with mental illness and their families and carers. And um, I think you, Mr Nicholson, highlighted how underdeveloped that concept has been in terms of the design of the current criminal justice system interfaces. And so that's something we'll have to really think about in terms of taking forward our ideas. Ms Coblin, thank you very much for leading the evidence before us this afternoon. Thank you to our three panel members, I should say this morning, nearly this afternoon. Um, our three panel members, again, for the care you put into the preparation of your witness statements, your comprehensive responses to our discussions today and for those where you've indicated a willingness to follow up on some of the issues with us, we will be very keen to take you up on those opportunities. So thank you all very much. Um, and we've had a very informative and helpful session this morning. So thank you.